Hello everybody, welcome to the crash course for the Rechtschaffen Institute of Judaic Studies course in the American Jewish Experience or Jewish American History. I'm not actually 100% sure what the course is going to be called as of right this second, but uh, I guess you'll know by the time you're watching this, so it's not that critical that I get the exact name of the course right. What this course is really focusing on, it's the American Jewish experience from a general perspective. In other words, not necessarily from specifically the Orthodox perspective or the non-Orthodox perspective. It's really a history of the immigration to the United States by Eastern European Jewry, starting at approximately 1880 and running really up until close to the present day. We'll discuss where the Jews were before they came over from Eastern Europe. This You're talking about, of course, the primary um, immigration to the United States by Jews. Jews have come from many different places at many different times, but the primary immigration from Europe to the United States came via Eastern European Jewry between approximately the year 1880 and through about World War II. And we're going to discuss the various steps in the Jewish immigration experience, some of the challenges they faced, and a whole bunch of other ancillary issues. I uh, hope you enjoy it. Let's, so let's get started with the presentation. First issue, and this is of course based on the textbook, which you hopefully have a copy of, World of Our Fathers, The Journey of the Eastern European Jews to America and the Life They Found and Made by Irving Howe. And if you look at the study guide, there are, I've assigned probably about, um, of the 18 chapters in the book, I think I assigned 12 of them plus the epilogue. Uh, the subjects that are covered in the book include the original, the, uh, the origins of the Jewish immigration to the United States, then the development of the Jewish communities in New York and specifically on the Lower East Side, and then the other issues regarding the politics of the immigrant Jews, the um, culture of the immigrant Jews, the effect they had on American society, and of course, almost as importantly, the effect that American society had on them. And the very first chapter in the text is entitled Origins. Origins, of course, means the origin of the Jewish community that eventually ended up in the United States starting in the 1880s. 1881, as the book says, is the year that the Jews turned west. There were some previous important days that are, dates that are discussed, of course, 70 in the Common Era. That was the day that the base of Magdus, second base of Magdus was destroyed by the Roman general Titus. Uh, 1492 was another critical date in Jewish history because that was the date that the Spanish Inquisition went into effect. That was the, I shouldn't say the Spanish Inquisition, but the expulsion of Spanish Jewry went into effect. The Inquisition was actually in effect a little bit earlier than that, but that was the day that the ex Jews were expelled from the Spanish Inquisition. Now, as background of the Jewish experience, as background of the Jewish immigration experience, it bears repeating or appears mentioning that the Jews in general were confined to a fairly small area of communities in Eastern Europe. Yes, there were Jewish communities in France. Yes, there were Jewish communities perhaps in other parts of Russia. But primarily, when you're talking about the vast, vast majority of Europe, Eastern European, of European Jewry, it was confined in certain Eastern European countries like Hungary and Poland and also in Western Russia, called the Pale of Settlements. And to help aid with this, I'm going to give you a little bit of a map over here. I mean, maps, the reason why I'm doing this now is because maps are going to be critical, or geography is critical in this course in general. So we do need to give you a little bit of uh, background over here. This, of course, is a map of Europe. It also has some areas of Asia and Africa down here. Of course, the United States is over here. You have the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, this is where you have Russia. Now. As we zoom in a little bit over here, uh, this area, and I'm changing to map view, it's not that critical that we see the geographic features. There, this area over here, Ukraine, Belarus, Moldova, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, this is Western, used to be part of the Soviet Union, and for our purposes, historically, these were generally part of Russia. 
Uh, th this is the area where most of the Russian Jews, Jews lived, starting in the Ukraine down here around Kiev, going up through Belarus and Minsk and many o areas over here, and going up through Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia. Uh, Lithuania, of course, was a hotbed of Judaism as well. The quote-unquote Litvax comes from the word Lithuania. And Eastern Jer you, Jews also lived in other parts of Eastern Europe, such as Poland, Romania, uh, Hungary, and areas this this basic area and this base really this greater circle is, is where most of the Jews lived. The reason why most of the Jews lived in Western Russia is because the under the Tsars, really before Napoleon and, and really before the 1800s, um, the Jews were actually forced to live in this area, the governing area of Russia, the power centers is, have always been in Moscow, and the Jews were forced to live all the way over here in the slightly poorer areas uh, that are closer to, closer to Europe. And after, even though this prohibition against Jews living in other areas, in eastern Russia, let's say, uh, were, was eventually lifted, most of the Jews who had lived there were either too poor or too entrenched to move, and so they pretty much stayed there. And most of the people that we're going to be looking at in terms of immigrants to the United States uh, really fit into three categories. There were the Russian Jews that lived in this area, Belarus, Ukraine, Lithuania. There were the other Eastern European Jews, the Polish Jews, the Romanian Jews, hung, hung, Hungarian Jews, and then we had the German Jews. The German Jews were, as we'll see a little bit later on in the presentation, had a little bit of a different uh, experience than the uh, Eastern European Jews, but certainly German Jews also accounted for a substantial portion of the Jewish immigrants to the United States. And when the Jews lived in this Pale of Settlements that we just looked at, it was not a very happy existence, by and large. In Tsarist Russia, in other words, Russia ruled by the Tsars, who were like their kings or emperors all the way until uh, 1917, when they were finally overthrown by the Communist Revolution, Jews were typically tolerated, but they were subject to periodic pogroms and consistent discrimination by the rest of the Russian people and by the Tsars. If you've ever seen Fiddler on the Roof, uh, that's just an example. Uh, the tolerance that the Jews received was typically for the purpose of stimulating the Russian and the Eastern European economies. In other words, this is, really goes back to the 15, 16, 1700s. Uh, they didn't really want Jews at all, but Jews were good at stimulating economic growth, and therefore they were tolerated to some extent. And through the 1800s, really at least until the reign of Alexander II, which was in the mid to late 1800s, uh, the anti-Jewish steps did increase, including the pogroms in the middle 1800s. Things did improve under Alexander II, which was a rel who was a relatively benevolent czar to the Jews, but still this really stimulated the Jews wanting to move out of Russia and eventually to the United States. So the next issue is, where did the Jews actually live when they were in Europe? And there were two basic types of communities that Jews lived in. There was the shtetl, and there were the, big, the Jewish areas of big cities in Eastern Europe. The shtetl was a very small and very insular community that Jews tended to live in, you know, little villages out of the way. The conditions in the shtetl, although sometimes it's glamorized in today's day and age, the conditions, conditions in the shtetl were typically very harsh. And virtually all effort was required in order to maintain a living, in order to maintain a livelihood. That <coughs> is actually one of the important themes we'll see a little bit later on in the course, and that is when Jews came to the U.S. and maybe had a little bit uh, more affluence than they did in the shtetl, things obviously changed very much in Jewish culture. In fact, in the shtetl, grinding poverty and really struggling to have the bare necessities was a way of life. So the shtetl is actually more a small city than a picturesque country village. You know, sometimes we picture a shtetl as being this leafy, uh, rural, farm-laden community uh, where everything was spread out and there was plenty of room and grass and everywhere. The you know, shtetl wasn't always like that. A shtetl was more like, it was a small area, it wasn't, it wasn't a big city, but it was probably much more compact and much more city-ish than perhaps what we look at. And 
in the shtetl, there was, of course, a tremendous amount of scholarship, typically with uh, Antora and Orthodox thought. Uh, scholarship was, considered, was regarded as a way of a release from the grinding daily tasks of earning a living. And scholarship, and especially teaching children, had a sacred place in the shtetl. That, of course, would continue as Jews came to the United States. The, in, the focus on education and the focus on scholarship would certainly continue in the United States, but the shtetl is where it got its original start. Then, of course, there were the cities. There was Warsaw, there was Kiev, there was Minsk, there was Budapest, Bucharest, and you know a whole bunch of other Eastern European cities where there were substantial Jewish communities. And these were made of Jewish people who had probably moved from the shtetls at one point or another, but they were able to become successful in business and they moved to a big city. Either they moved to a big city to manage their business from there, if they had a business with headquarters in Warsaw, or if they, if they managed a store or a distribution place in Budapest, well then they had to move to the city, or they moved to the city simply to get away from life in the shtetl. You know, life in the shtetl may have been Id idyllic in some sense, but life in the shtetl could also have been could also be very difficult. And if there was an escape from Jews that could afford to move to the city because of their business interests, very often did did so. In the city, the Jews typically had more time available to them, away from the grinding poverty and the struggle to eke out an existence, and many of the Jewish scholars in the, or the cultural contributors did come from the city because of the fact that they did have more time available to them. And although in the shtetl, typical language was Yiddish, regardless of where the shtetl was, the richer Jews in the cities were more likely to speak their native languages, or even to speak Hebrew, than the shtetl Jews who typically conversed in Yiddish. Certainly in many German communities, for example, the Jews that lived in the cities would typically speak German. And the people, the Jews that lived in Warsaw may, sp may have spoken Polish, whereas the Polish shtetls almost certainly spoke Yiddish. One real common theme throughout, the, uh, throughout life in the shtetl and life in the larger Jewish communities uh, in the cities is that, especially in Eastern Europe, there was a very strong relationship with Hashem. There was a very strong religious aspect to these people's lives. Now that, of course, on, you know, would change as they moved across the Atlantic Ocean to the United States in many ways. And certainly in other parts of Europe, the Haskalah had been devastating. Certainly in Germany, probably 90 to 95 percent of Jews were, not, were no longer Orthodox uh, because of the Haskalah, because of the Enlightenment. But in the shtetl especially, and even to a lesser extent in the cities, there still was the almost the thing that the people lived for was the was the religion and the relationship with Hashem, because of the idea that uh, there was really not that much else to live for. You know, there wasn't that much culture in the shtetls, there wasn't that much education, there wasn't. I mean, Jewish education there was, secular education much less so. Uh, there wasn't a lot of prosperity, but there was religion, and religion is what people focused on very much. And also their religion was a unifying force and it kept people together people were didn't you know they were they were in fear of pogroms they were in desperate poverty and all of that helped them stay together have a lot more achtas than maybe some other communities did or do to this day because of these things that they had to suffer with together more kind of background to the story of Jewish emigration to the United States were forces of change in Jewish life, certainly emphasized in the book as a catalyst to Jews leaving Europe. First and foremost among them was the Shabzai Tzvi incident. Now the Shabzai Tzvi incident, for those of you that may not be familiar, uh, Shabzai Tzvi was a Turkish Jew uh, who was born in Smyrna in Turkey. Uh, he was born in the probably the middle 1600s early to middle 1600s. Anyway, he claimed to be Mashiach, and he, at one point or another, he had fooled probably a majority of the Jewish people, certainly of the Eastern European and Turkish Jews, um, into thinking that he was Mashiach. There have been many false Mashiachs over the years, but he was probably the most successful. And 
when he was exposed, he eventually converted to Islam because the Turkish Sultan threatened to either to kill him if he didn't convert to Islam, and he did, and that had a devastating impact on the on the Jewish communities. Uh, the Jews had assumed that Mashiach was there. They, many of them had actually sold their houses. They had, uh, you know, taunted the Gentile neighbors because they thought Mashiach was there. And when that didn't pan out, it had a devastating impact. There were actually some Jewish communities that uh, did not that still believed that he was the Mashiach even after he converted to Islam. And believe it or not, even to this day, there are some religions that have been, little minor religions that have been, been spawned off by Shab Saitzvi and his followers. Um, and But this this caused a devastating impact on the Jewish people because for 15, 20 years they had believed that Mashiach was there and they were going to end their second-class oppressed um status and when that didn't work out they got desperate many Jews turned to various other uh poss- various other movements in order to kind of try to cope with the reality that things were not going to change um things even things like the 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 the, the Musser movement the Hasidish movement even even part the Haskala the enlightenment which was the really started in Germany in the 1700s and led to most Central European Jews leaving and becoming not Orthodox anymore. Uh, very Many people think that that had its roots in the Shab Tzvi incident, that people were just so desperate, people were unwilling to continue the status quo. And, you know, the uh, Shab Tzvi was exposed in 1660-something, 1666, I believe, if I remember correctly. And the Haskalah had its roots, well, probably a good, a good number of years later, but at least that's one possible theory, that that actually may have led to the Haskalah to some extent. Uh, there was also, of course, the Hasidic movement. The Hasid, uh, and the, the Hasidic movement is really not so much of what we have in terms of Hasidim today. The Hasidim movement of the 1700s and 1800s focused more on joy and happiness of life than on traditional scholarly-based Torah. Today, the Hasidic movement is kind of a little bit of a hybrid between those two things and certainly focuses a lot more on Torah than the Hasidim of the 1700s and 1800s did. But in those days, Hasidism was based on the idea idea that the same old scholarly emphasis was just, I guess, depressing, <laughs> for lack of a better term. Uh, there's also the Musser movement, and it would be Charles Lanter, of course, in the 1800s, and that was based on the idea of ethical purification. So whereas traditionally Jews had focused only on Torah and knowledge and halacha, uh, these movements of the 1700s and 1800s focused a little bit more on different things. The Enlightenment, of course, on secular pursuits, uh, Hasidim on, on happiness and joy, and the Muslim movement on ethical purification rather than just Torah. Uh, there were also other subcultures among Eastern European Jews, among the non-Orthodox, but even to some extent among the Orthodox as well. Uh, there was Zionism, Zionism, of course, under Theodore Herzl, was lived in the mid to late 1800s, uh, was the idea of establishing a homeland, a Jewish homeland in modern-day Israel, which, of course, eventually did come to fruition in 1947. But that was the idea, not necessarily a religious idea. Zionism, generally speaking, was not a religious idea, and to this day remains a non-religious idea, is the idea of establishing a Jewish homeland in what is today Israel. Socialism. Jews very often supported socialism. Of course, Karl Marx himself, who is considered the godfather of socialist and communist uh, thought, himself was had had Jewish uh, background. <coughs> socialism is something that poor people in general, and for that reason Jews as well, uh, had a strong inclination towards, especially in Eastern Europe. There was also an idea of Yiddishism, which will become very important as we move along in this course. Yiddishism is, not, again, it's not necessarily based on a religious principle. Yiddishism is based on the idea of the Jews, and the Yiddish-speaking people specifically, having a separate culture, uh, really dedicated to the preservation of Yiddish culture, not necessarily of Jewish, and not necessarily of religious anything, but dedicated to the preservation of Yiddish culture and Jews as kind of like a separate cultural entity. These are three movements that would have a extremely important ramifications on Jews as they moved along into the uh, into United into the United States some huge cultural figures oh.
of Eastern Europe that, again, we're going to come back to as we move along. But these are, again, not religious figures, but figures who had a very strong cultural impact on the Jews of Eastern Europe. There are some important, there's some people that you might have actually heard of. Uh, there was Mendel Mochersfarm, who was considered the grandfather of Yiddish literature, probably the most prolific and most important Yiddish language writer. Then there was the famous Shalom Aleichem, who was a prolific uh, Yiddish playwright and author. And his narratives were notable for the naturalness of the character's speech and his description of shtetl life. Very often, people's impression of what shtetl life was like is based on the writings of Shalom Aleichem. Um, he was also an advocate of Yiddish nationalism, or Yiddishism, as we just discussed. He also was, I guess, famous in the interpretation of the people who have studied his works for trying to cope with adversity. Cheerful characters. Even though shtetl life obviously wasn't always that pleasant. There was Isaac Leib Peretz, whose writing emphasized the importance of uh, sincere piety as, as opposed to empty religiousness. There was Abraham Risen, who was a writer, uh, who was a uh, writer, poet, and editor, wrote various other things. But the point is, some of these characters, really the, the big three are the first three on this. Mendel Mokrosfarm, Shalom Lechem, and Isaac Leib Peretz are people, the people who really had the greatest impact on Jewish literature. Reason was not quite as critical, though he also had an impact, and the book lists a whole bunch of other uh, people who had impact on Jewish culture, or Yiddish culture. Uh, Reason had some cl uh, some clever titles. You can see over here, <laughs> the um, the this was a, a something he wrote called "Damn the Nose." As long as there's a dowry of a watch and 300 rubles, I guess that's kind of a sad, a sour commentary on the on the, the shidduch crisis of the day, so to speak. All right. Other things that caused change in the Jewish community, there were various other historical events. Uh, first of all, there were legal restrictions. There were legal restrictions on what the Jewish could do, uh, Jews could do in terms of making a living, and uh, socially, that's one thing that caused the caused them to leave Europe. Napoleon's emancipation blurred the class lines and decreased the Jews' role as economic middlemen. That means that historically Jews had always provided services as bankers. Uh, there were various reasons for that. Uh, one reason was the Catholic Church prohibited uh, the charging of interest, and so therefore the non-Jews couldn't do it. There were uh, Jews had certain talents in terms of um, economic policy and banking, but but basically because after the early 1800s when Napoleon basically changed the way European Europe ran and everywhere he went he brought Enlightenment principles with him, uh, there wasn't that much of a class structure where the Jews could fill the role as bankers, and that took, you know, took away a little bit of their ability to have a consistent role in terms of making a living. Shtetl residents often moved not to the away from the shtetl, to get away from the shtetl, but, all, but very often ended up in bigger slums. The increased development of socialism and radicalism among Jews also, of course, helped spur the emigration from Europe. And Jews of the late 1800s in general sought to escape these conditions by emigrating away from Europe. Okay, so that describe some of the reasons why Jews actually left Europe. Now let's look at some of these specifics. And now we're getting into chapter two of the book. Um, this is, it's an incredible statistic. In the 33 years after the assassination of Alexander II, who was generally good to the Jews, approximately a third of European Jews left, tried to emigrate to the United States, most of them successfully. For also, positive reports of the Jews who actually got to the United States and sent back letters, and we'll see their life wasn't exactly easy once they got here, but at least it was probably better than the life in the shtetl and the uh, big cities in Eastern Europe. They got letters back saying that life is a little bit better here. And the worsening conditions in Eastern Europe, the increased pogroms, and the worsening in conditions in general caused Jews to want to leave. A small number of Jews, a minority, wanted to leave for ideolo ideological reasons because of the because they were morally opposed to the corrupt and backwards Eastern European governments. The one thing that held many Jews back 
was the fact that, especially at the time, the United States had very little religious infrastructure. You know, today we think of the United States and we think of Lakewood and and uh, Yeshiva Pseik and Philadelphia, and it wasn't it wasn't like that in the 1880s. I mean, there were no Jewish day schools, let alone uh, Jewish yeshivas. Um, you know, the the first trickle of Jewish day schools wouldn't start for a while. And the infrastructure was virtually non-existent. He moved to the United States, spiritually it was almost like a complete vacuum. So many of the people for whom religion was important, especially in the shtetls, didn't want to come to the United States because there was very little religious infrastructure in terms of yeshiva systems, etc. Okay, so let's take a look at how the Jews actually moved. Where did they go? Well, from the the book actually goes through a whole I'm not you know goes through a whole uh, step by step travel process. I'm just going to cover it in general. In fact, we'll look at the map uh, after this after the slide. From the Ukraine and South Russia, they had to get into Austria Hungary, and then by train to the northern European seaports. We'll look at that in a minute. Again, from western and northwest Russia, again they'd have to they'd they'd have to leave essentially. Um, Eastern European Jews, it wasn't that easy to get out. First of all, the countries in Central Europe weren't really interested in allowing them passage. Uh, leaving wasn't always legal. And in fact, all of these things, the danger and require uh, danger was always there in terms of people leaving, and paying bribes and having long waits it was very much a part of this passage you know those of you that had grandparents or great grandparents that did emigrate to the united states from eastern europe very often you can have there might be stories that you might have heard in family lore about the immigrant experience it was certainly not always that pleasant so let's look at the map again. Uh, the basic idea is as follows. In order to get to the United States, of course, you have to cross the Atlantic Ocean. We're moving across the Atlantic Ocean, and here is New York. This is where everybody was, pretty much everybody was headed eventually. But let's move back to Europe. Now, as we discussed before, the Jews typically lived in Ukraine, Belarus, Lithuania, uh, Poland, Romania, and also in Central Europe. This area over here, Austria, Hungary, including most of Czechoslovakia, parts of uh, what is, you know, the former Yugoslavia. This whole area over here basically used to be a country called Austria-Hungary. Austria-Hungary was one of the central powers during World War I, and as a consequence, after World War I, they were broken up into a whole bunch of little countries rather than one major empire called Austria-Hungary. So there were Jews that lived over here in Austria-Hungary. There were Jews that lived in Germany. There were Jews that lived in this area called the Balkans. Uh, in the former Yugoslavia, Romania. Then, of course, there were Jews that lived in Poland, and there were Jews that lived in these areas. So Jews that lived in the Balkans over here, or Austria-Hungary, or Germany... I'm sorry, let me back up, back up for a second. Everybody had to get to a seaport, to a major seaport, in order to leave Europe. Uh, typically, uh, the seaports, uh, the most common ones are over here, uh, Amsterdam, Hamburg, which was in northern Germany, and ports in northern Europe over here. It was also possible sometimes for Jews to leave from ports in uh, in the Baltic countries, and what was Russia then, um, Riga and Tallinn, which were in northern Europe over here. But t most Jews had to get to these ports in order to get passage. Once they got to these ports, as long as they had the money, they could pay for passage to the United States. The immigration po um, policies of the U.S. were much more lax than they are today. So Jews that already were in Central Europe, Jews that already were in Germany or Austria-Hungary or Romania, uh, could simply get passage. It was usually legal to go through this area. They could just simply get passage to Hamburg or to Amsterdam, and it really wasn't as big a deal. Their their hardest thing was getting the money to uh, to get passage on a ship and to make sure to actually get that passage. If you started out over here, it was much more difficult. Um, I started out in Ukraine, Belarus, Lithuania. Germany and Austria-Hungary, which were the big Central European powers, were not really interested in having the riffraff from Eastern Europe get into their country. So if you were in the Ukraine, you very often had to sneak across the Austria-Hungarian border uh, illegally, just in order to have a chance to get all the way to the Northern European ports. If you were in Northern Europe already, again, you can go through Poland, but again, you might have to sneak into Germany illegally in order to get to these ports. Or if you could arrange passage from Riga, of course, that saved a little bit of time and energy. I 
very often people would get passage from Riga to Northern Europe. You know, there may not have been ships going from Riga all the way to the United States, but they may have gotten passage from Riga to other Northern European ports. Actually, with my great grandfather, uh, originally lived in uh, Belarus, and when they when they left, they left much later. But when they did leave, they ended up staying in. Um, I think Latvia for several months and Riga for several months before they got passage to Northern Europe and from Northern Europe they eventually got passage to the United States. One thing that did help in the immigrants process was the fact that the people along the way whose permission they needed to immigrate to the United States were relatively favorable. First of all, German Jews were typically helpful of Eastern European Jews to make their journey safer and easier. Remember, as we saw, many of the Jews in Eastern Europe had to go through Germany in order to get to those uh, Northern European ports, and the German Jews who were in Germany were, were helpful to them. Americans also were generally open to immigration. A little less so for Eastern Europeans and Jews, but certainly the immigrant immigration policies of the US then were a lot more favorable than today. Today you have all sorts of waiting periods and everything. As we'll see, then you could just kind of land at Ellis Island and as long as uh, you know, you had, uh, as long as things, you, generally speaking, you were healthy and uh, maybe educated, whatever it is, you had a pretty good chance of getting in. Uh, Jews in the United States were a little nervous at first at the people coming, uh, basically the Jews who already did live here in the big cities, they didn't want so many, so much competition for jobs, but eventually they did assist with the immigration and integration of Eastern European Jews, so those things did certainly help. Also, of course, many Jews, with or without the friendliness of the recipients, were very enticed by the prospect of coming to the United States. As I mentioned before, Jews from the U.S. consistently wrote back optimistic letters to Eastern Europe, and the ones that did go back to Eastern Europe, you know, the ones that could afford to travel back to Eastern Europe, very often had made it, had done very well in the United States, and that enticed many people to go. Also, and this this was an attitude not just among Eastern European Jewry, but among Europe in general at the time that the United States was the quote unquote land of opportunity that people could people would have a fair chance if they worked hard to make a good le living and even to become rich um, not not just based on how they were born or how they uh, what their opportunities were early in life but that they would have the opportunity to make something of themselves if they work hard and that's really what Eastern European Jews wanted they didn't necessarily want a guarantee they didn't necessarily need a guarantee of doing well they wanted an opportunity because they felt that given the opportunity that they would do well the journey really was the critical part the journey was the hard part the greatest danger, especially to Jews in Poland and Eastern Europe, was getting across the border to Germany. As I mentioned before, Germany didn't really want East Polish and Russians, especially Jews, coming across their border so easily. They didn't allow it. Now, they didn't have the same kind of border security as they do today. You know, Today they may have barbed wire fences and, and, and soldiers with machine guns uh, manning the border. In those days they didn't exactly have that. So smuggling and sneaking across the border was not nearly as difficult. But it was still fairly dangerous. Groups of refugees were often robbed or held for ransom or double-crossed double by the people that promised to get them across the border into Germany. Once in Germany, however, the Jewish organizations in Germany, as I mentioned before, typically did try to take care to make sure that they were as comfortable as possible. And, of course, one thing that the, Jew, the Jews and all immigrants had to make sure is that they didn't catch any diseases, because even once you got to Ellis Island in the United States, uh, if you had a disease, you could be held or sent back. So, and again, also it did, of course, cost a lot of money. It wasn't like buying an airline ticket that you just buy the ticket and you're there. Uh, these boats were, even the steerage quarters of these boats, even the third-class accommodations were quite expensive. And so very often people couldn't afford to bring their families over uh, right away. They would, people would go themselves, men, young men would go themselves and try to get jobs in New York, and maybe they would try to send money back for their families to be able to come later on. Sometimes they would sneak across the German border as a family and get to Hamburg, or Amsterdam, and then they wouldn't have enough money for everybody to go, so the man would go, and then uh, six months later he would send money back for his family who had been living in Hamburg for six months to get on a boat and be able to come back. Once they did reach the United States, 
or uh, once they did reach the boats, first of all, the trip itself probably wasn't very pleasant. The Jews typically traveled in steerage on the ships, and the conditions in these areas often were terrible. And once they reached New York, they were processed in Ellis Island, which at the time was the major immigrant processing er processing area. Um, again, I'll show you where that is. Well, anyway, this is Northern Europe. We're back. Let's go back to the map over here. These are the ports where the Jews would typically take off from Hamburg or Amsterdam, Antwerp. These ports over here, they would go across the Atlantic Ocean. You can see this is a really long journey in those days. Now you can go on airplanes. They go 600 miles an hour. Those days you couldn't. The major area where the ships would land would be in the city of New York. And as we go down, in those days, the city of New York primarily meant Manhattan. This, of course, is Manhattan, this area over here. The ships would come from the Atlantic Ocean, which was over here. They would come up through the lower bay into New York Harbor. And once they were in New York Harbor, the ships would land right over here at Ellis Island. Here's Liberty Island, where the Statue of Liberty is. Here's Governor's Island. Um, this is, of course, Lower Manhattan. And the, primarily, even though New York City is now much bigger than this, and there's a lot of the population is enormous going out in Brooklyn and Queens also, but in those days, especially in the 1800s, this is where New York really was, Lower Manhattan, this area, from the Battery up to you know, not that further up. All the way up here was still kind of suburbs, where, you know, where Central Park is. Um, but <coughs> over here, where you had um, Ellis Island, that's where all the immigrants would have to land. And once on Ellis Island, um, they were kept pending physical and mental examinations. Questionable ones, ones that might not be mentally competent or might have diseases, were held in cages. With it wasn't probably wasn't I'm sorry I'm laughing but uh, they were literally held in cages with with a tag on it that says you know maybe uh, crazy or maybe uh, may ha might have typhus or might have cholera or something. People that were found to be mentally or physically defective could be sent back to Europe. But the I mean I guess the good part is, is that if you were found to be physically and mentally sound, you were probably going to be left into the United States. And that change. Um, there, the transition was helped a lot by Jewish organizations such as the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society or the HIAS. This was a Jewish organization that was established to try to make things easier for the Jewish immigrants. They would be on Ellis Island to try to mediate conversations with immigration officials. You know, the people that came over may only speak Yiddish or only speak German or something. And the immigration officials, as you can probably imagine, spoke English. And so they would try, the immigrate, these Hebrew immigrant aid officials would be there to try to interpret, uh, to help the transition and help the immigration officials understand what the immigrants were saying. They would protest the conditions in steerage in, to the European shipping companies if the conditions were particularly bad as they ver in, on the ships, as they very often were. They would keep the immigrants away from con men who were trying to take advantage, as you can imagine, people landing in the United States for the first time, not even knowing the language, really having no idea where they are. I mean, this is back in those days where there was no such thing as an airplane, and they were you know, four or 5,000 miles away from home and not really having any idea where they were, they were susceptible to people who would <coughs> try to rip them off, try to steal their things with promises, etc. They would also give advice and bulletins to the new immigrants and to fight against anti-immigration groups and groups that want to place restrictions on immigration. So the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, as you can probably imagine, were a tremendous help in integrating the new immigrants to the United States. An American reaction, in spite of the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, was not always favorable to the immigrants. While many businesses were happy to have the new labor pool, people that were running sweatshops were happy to have people coming and working in their sweatshops, there were many people, nativists so to speak, who were upset at the introduction of the competition and these uncultured, the unwashed masses so to speak from Eastern Europe. They, these did lead to uh, immigration restrictions, where even though the restriction, the immigration policy was much more to do things like, um, again, these, I'm sorry, even though the immigration restrictions were much less than they are today, still there were certain movements to tighten up the borders a little bit. This led to things like broadening excluded classes 
you know, to say that people who can't sustain themselves financially, people who can't work to sustain themselves, can't come in. People who didn't pay their own fare to the U.S. can't come in. Uh, people who certain political ideologies, maybe Marxist, maybe radicals, uh, anarchists, people like that couldn't come in. People who were illiterate in their own languages very often were excluded based on the idea that they weren't going to make much of a contribution. Uh, on the other hand, Jewish Americans, including people like Louis Marshall, named just a name in the book, led organizations such as the American Jewish Community, Committee to try to fight against um, against immigration that prejudiced uh, immigration policies. Okay, which Jews generally did come to the United States? Well, obviously, you don't have the statistics as that you like you do today, where newspapers will report, you know, to to the exact percentage where everybody comes from. But still, there are general trends that we can do, deduce from the historical records. First of all, whole families came rather than single individuals. Families that found it very hard to make a living. For, for people very often would move their families over to New York to try it because they couldn't make a living for their entire family in Europe. People that came tended to be younger. Generally speaking, it's always easier for younger people to move. They have fewer roots. Uh, they can come a little bit. They can travel a little bit easier, etc. Immigrants did come to settle permanently in the United States. They did not generally come just to make money and go home. You know, sometimes you have people from Central America that come to the United States or Mexico that come to the United States just to work and go home, work a little bit and save some money and go home. That wasn't really true in the case of the Jewish immigrants. And as the book points out, the immigration could be viewed as just really one more step in the relocation of the Jews. First it was from the shtetl to the cities, and then from the Eastern European cities to the American cities. Okay, now we get into the third uh, chapter over here in the book, and we start getting into the for early Jewish settlements in the United States. Now, of course, today there are many, many, many Jewish communities of varying sizes and importance in the United States. In those days, really almost all of the Jewish communities sprung from the immigrant Jewish community on the Lower East Side. Most of the people, when they got through Ellis Island, they were able, you know, they... Uh, Where's the map again? Yeah, here's the map. Once they got off Ellis Island and they were allowed to take a boat to Manhattan, they were allowed to take a ferry to Manhattan, they got off on Battery Park and they didn't have far to go <laughs> because the Lower East Side is around here. See, so actually you can see on the map it says Lower East Side. So uh, this is this area over here. Now, of course, have the FDR Drive. In those days there was no FDR Drive. But this area over here in the Lower East Side, this is where the Jewish community really sprung up, really south of Houston Street and probably um, east of the east of the Bowery, this kind of uh, quadrant or uh, rectangle over here. So this is where typically the Jews um, would would settle at the very at the beginning. Eventually, as we'll see, they spread out to other communities. But this was the first real immigrant Jewish communities. And <clears throat> the problem, the, the good news was, is that jobs were plentiful. There were plenty of sweatshops there. There were people that wanted cheap labor. The bad news is living conditions were poor. Work was available really only in the sweatshops. It wasn't like there were a bunch of accountant and lawyer jobs. And another big problem was that. First, the employers didn't want to. Give, very often, employers had six-day work weeks, including Saturday. They were only off. They were only off Sundays, and they didn't want to give people jobs if they didn't come. You know, the old expression: "If you don't come to work on Saturday, don't come on Monday," was was very popular in those days, where Jews who were religious and wanted to keep Shabbos and Yom Tovim have found it very difficult to maintain a job. The living conditions were horrendous. They were in the, what are called tenements. There's actually a museum, a very interesting museum called the Lower East Side Tenement Museum. Uh, you can go down there in the Lower East Side of Manhattan and tour and what used to, what was the where where the people lived called tenements, which is really just another word for apartments in slums, um, where they were the 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 immigrant lives were very tight. They were they were li they lived together very tightly. There were very little room and they were bug ridden. Few wanted to go back to Europe because I guess conditions in Europe were even worse, but it's not like the conditions in the Lower East Side were great.
Um, these, this Erie in the Lower East Side was such a draw. It was such a draw for the immigrants who really had nowhere else to go. You know, they went there because their friends who had immigrated earlier lived there. Maybe their relatives lived there. Their other Jewish, other Jewish people lived there. They couldn't exactly move to other places where they literally had nobody that they knew and barely, they didn't even speak the language for the most part. Um, <clears throat> so this area became a mix of many different Eastern European cultures: religious, non-religious, Polish, German, Russian. Romanian, Hungarian, etc. And sometimes referred to as the gray stone world because of the look of the tenements. The, it was just a whole bunch of gray drab apartments, one after another after another, with very little relief. Okay, now let's switch gears a little bit and discuss the immigrants' assimilation into American culture. Now, first of all, obviously, it was a massive adjustment to a brand new culture and a brand new language and everything from Eastern Europe to the United States. But Jews in the U.S. actually may have had an easier time adjusting to the culture, or at least adjusting to the status as a minority, which, of course, they were in the U.S., because of the fact that they had been pariahs, which means, you know, kind of like a hated minority in Europe. And because of that, they were kind of used to used to it. Uh, things may have been actually a little bit better in the U.S. on the discrimination front than they were in Eastern Europe. Still, many Jews did miss the Eastern European culture and the Yiddish culture that they had developed in the shtetl or in the cities. And that, of course, was an impetus to bring that culture over to the U.S. to some extent. Now, the Jews, of course, including the immigration organizations that we discussed earlier, uh, were generally friendly to the to the new immigrant Jews. But even in even in the Jewish communities, there may have been a little bit of resent resent sometimes, resentfulness sometimes to the new uh, influx of Eastern European Jewry. This, this is especially true with the German Jews, who were already in New York, who looked at the Eastern European Jews who had immigrated from Russia and Eastern Europe as being maybe a little bit less cultured, a little bit less uh, educated, a little bit more crass. And uh, so they, they, so the Jews face not only a little bit of resistance in the general American public, but even a little bit of resistance in the existing immigrant Jewish community, especially from the German immigrant Jewish immigrants. Christian missionaries also sometimes tried to convert the new immigrants, because I guess they were ripe for the taking. You know, they landed here; they were no longer in the shtetl. Uh, many of them were spiritually confused at the time, and they were ripe for Christian missionaries as well. Now, for the Jewish immigrants, they were, as we discussed, it was a difficult life and they worked very hard. Uh, long hours by people were routine for people trying to earn a living. Jews did tend to work very hard in their new environments, whether they were managing something or working in a sweatshop or whatever they were doing, they worked very hard to try to provide for their families and very often to try to provide for their families back in Europe as well. Uh, Torah study in the late 1800s, when these immigrants very often took a back seat to economic activity. Generally speaking, although the wave of Jewish immigrants that came over during World War II uh, very often tended to stay Orthodox as the as time went on, as the decades went on, that wasn't really true of this wave of immigrants. This wave of immigrants from the 1880s, 1890s, 1900s by and large, especially a generation or two down the road, tended to become non-Orthodox, tended to become not from. Uh, you know, the, the huge population of, not, of non-religious uh, Jews in the United States today, and the reason why probably 85% of American Jews are not Orthodox, is really a product of the fact that of they, most of those people are children of these generation, the Eastern European Jews who immigrated to the United States in the late 1800s and early 1900s. They didn't stay Orthodox, and one of the reasons is because Torah study and religious studies in general took a back seat to trying to earn a living. They came over, they had to work extremely hard to make a living, and they just didn't have the time or the energy to study Torah. And that's one of the reasons why many Jews, as we discussed before, many Jews remaining in Eastern Europe were warned not to come to the U.S. by religious religious authorities because of the fact that the people that did come here really kind of lost their religion a little bit. And that's one reason why many Jews actually stayed in Europe, stayed in Eastern Europe. Um, Jews often, in order to escape the sweatshop, became salespeople became door-to-door -door salespeople, they became peddlers. 
Uh, and this may have been a little bit less tedious and a little bit less difficult than working in a sweatshop, you know, working in a factory. A sweatshop, by the way, I don't know if I've defined it before, it was like a factory where people work long hours to make things like, uh, you know, clothing and toys and things like that. <coughs> Even though being a peddler uh, was very difficult and very depressing work, and in fact was little more than house-to-house -house knocking, uh, you know, kind of a door-to-door -door salesperson, it was still very often better than working in a sweatshop for many people. In the, there was actually a poll about immigrants, a very famous poll called the Baron de Hirsch poll. Let's look at some of the numbers. More than half, there were over 110,000 people um, that were studied over here of Jewish immigrants. You can imagine there were tremendous numbers of Jewish immigrants from Europe at this time. Of these people, more than half of them were children. Over 22,000 was employed, and of those, 13,000 of those, which is about 60% of the entire number, were shop workers in the needle trades. Essentially, they were working, creating things like in a sweatshop. There were 1,540 shopkeepers, and 2,440 of them described themselves as peddlers. They worked in the garment industry, especially purchasing and running factories. So most of the Jews became factory workers, shop workers, peddlers. Some Jews that did well also made strides and worked in the garment industry. They worked in the garment industry um, and also supervisors of people who worked in the store. Supervisors would live in, in the apartments over the factories to kind of supervise and make sure that they were running day and night. And this was actually a good thing also the supervisors, because if they were the supervisor, they could make the determination whether to work on Shabbos, and that's why some Jews were able to avoid doing that. Okay, and next we're going to segue into some various other aspects of Jewish life. One thing emphasized by the book was the organization called Am Olam. Am Olam was a group of formed by Russia, formed in Russia actually, back in the 1880s, that sought a radical escape from the economic ruthlessness that had plagued the Jewish people. In other words, the trying to make generally a better society for people who are poor and Jews specifically. And once the immigrant community moved to the United States, of course elements of this group also moved to the United States, and <clears throat> they created a new Jewish community in the United States, like a new sub-organization. And their idea was basically established on socialist principles, on the idea that rather than having everybody intertwined, uh, you know, making all their money working in the sweatshops, uh, working for non-Jewish uh, sweatshop owners, instead their idea was to create like a kibbutz-like structure, kibbutz-like economic structure. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Israeli kibbutz movement, but basically what the kibbutz movement is, is that rather than working as part of the economy of a city, a bunch of people move into an open area, maybe a farm, a research area, and they all pull their resources together. You know, rather than everybody trying to make as much money as they can, the whole community makes money as a whole, as an entire economic unit, and they give out the money equally, or pretty equally, to all the individuals in the community. So it's like kind of like a commune, kind of the sort of, sort of thing where it's, it's really built on socialist principles, where everybody should work for the benefit of the entire community and everybody should be treated relatively equally. The idea was is that this would keep the product within the community and would give everybody a chance at a better life. And this was certainly successful later on in Israel, but it wasn't so successful in the United States. They did set up colonies in the south in places like Louisiana and Arkansas, Amolam trying to create these ideal communities, but they didn't really work because of, uh, there are a whole bunch of reasons, basically in the book there are interesting stories about how they failed, but very often they failed because of natural disaster, disease, hurricanes, flooding, things like that. Internal dispute also hurt the movement. So Amolam was kind of like a precursor to the kibbutz movement, but it didn't really work. Now, the tenement life, back to the Jews in the Lower East Side, the tenement life, of course, the tenements, the apartments were very small, and families, not only did they have to live in these very small apartments in the tenements, very often they would have to take on borders in order to help make ends meet. And 
They couldn't afford to pay the rent by themselves, so they took on single people who would help pay the rent in exchange for in exchange for living there. And tenement life was so dreary and so harsh that escape from the tenements was essentially considered um, a goal of every person who had the opportunity. As soon as you were rich enough to move to uh, to a separate area, could be within the Lower East Side or within, or within a different community in New York, people did. Um, there are different examples over here, though, that the that the book gives of where people did, even though tenement life was very difficult, there were organizations and acts that were done of kindness where people did help each other to try to at least make bearable the tenement experience. Lillian Wald was an example who provided care and medicine to hundreds or thousands of tenement families. Uh, Jacob Schiff, who was a actually a wealthy person, who was a philanthropist of German-Jewish origin, was involved in various charitable causes to try to help the Jewish population. Next, let's look at the issue of religion. Now, I mentioned this before that many of the immigrants that came across, probably most of the immigrants that came originally were Orthodox, were originally uh, t you know, Torah, Torah Jews. This changed as it went along, but let's take a look at how that changed. First of all, of course, when the immigrants came over, there were no yeshivas, there were no Jewish day schools, there were no, there was very little religious infrastructure uh, at the beginning. Certainly in the 18 in the 1800s, and the, before the immigrant wave, there was virtually nothing. So, when the Jews came over, when they did develop the funds to do that, first of all, they did build shuls, very often large, impressive shuls with impressive architecture. Many of those shuls are still standing, um, probably more so even than the shuls that are built today in terms of impressive architecture. They did want to preserve, certainly, the Jewish culture at least. And very often they did hire Malamdim to teach Torah to the children who were attending public schools. Uh, they couldn't afford their own day school system, so instead what they did was they had the children go to public school until you know three or four o'clock or whatever it was. And then in the late afternoon or the evening, they were sent to Talmud Torah, they were sent to Malamdim, they were sent to individual uh, teachers who would teach them, teach them Torah. This, of course, was the religious families. And one of the things that many of the immigrants wanted to be these Malamdim, Malamdim had a, had a good job. Um, first of all, they, if they were religious people, they were fairly, they were trained for it almost inherently. You know, to be a Malamid, all you really had to do was to know a little bit about Torah. Um, and second of all, it was much less difficult than working in the factories. Teaching Torah to children wasn't as hard as, you know, sewing a clo new clothing for 16 hours a day. Now, the problem with this system, of course, you know, they had a lot of malamdim, and they had willingness of the parents to set them up, but the problem was is that it was very difficult for the children. You know, the public schools, especially in those days, were designed to be full-day activities. They weren't designed to, you know, end at 12 or, 12 or 1 o'clock and then do stuff in the afternoon. These were real serious schedules that they had that lasted all day. Then the children who came over, you know, the children of the immigrants, whose children, parents were desperate, and they were generally from poor families, after a full day of public school, they had to go at night and learn for three hours from a, from, from a Malamed. And the children typically didn't react to this, which is another reason why the movement, why the immigrant children of the immigrants typically became non-religious, because they felt that the Jewish education that they were getting was a tremendous burden on them. And that caused problems with the youth in those days, the children of the immigrants. Disorderly children and gang activity were byproducts of these difficult schedules, and also they had little time to spend with their parents. Um, even though crime rates did remain lower than the surrounding Gentile communities, it was still very difficult for the children. Their parents were working in a sweatshop, maybe there was only one parent there, another might have been back in Europe, who knows, they didn't have much extended family, their extended family might have been back in Europe, they lived in squalor with borders and tiny little apartments, and they had to go to public school all day, and they had to go to a Malamed at night. It was, you know, it was a fairly difficult life for the children. Now we're going to switch gears a little bit. Until now we've been discussing the experience of the immigrants and the life that they found here. Now I want to move a little bit, as the book does, to the culture and the thoughts, the thinking that was done and generated by the Eastern European Jewish immigrants. First of all, we had the Yiddish theater. Today you don't have that too much, but in those days they had actual plays and, and uh, things that were put on in Yiddish.
for the benefit of the immigrant population, which still mostly spoke Yiddish, of course. They even had quote-unquote sweatshop poets, people that had to work in the sweatshop all day, but while they were working or at the, during their scarce free time, they were able to put together poetry and works of literature, and they were called the quote-unquote um, sweatshop poets. These were generally the cultural figures in the 1880s and 1890s in New York were typically left-leaning, you know, socialists, communists, liberals, and they were very often anti-religious or anti-orthodox and promoted, promoted left-wing political philosophies like socialism and anarchism. Socialism is the idea that, uh, you know, it's the opposite of, of capitalism. Socialism is the idea that the, uh, everybody should be equal and, and uh, people shouldn't be allowed to hoard amount of money. And anarchism is the idea of getting rid of the government, <laughs> having no government at all. And anarchism is really, isn't really that common today. I mean, today you call somebody an anarchist, that's automatically considered an insult. Uh, you know, back in the 1800s, anarchism was a little bit more of a popular political philosophy. I mean, this has nothing to do with Jews, but uh, Sacco and Vanzetti, the two Italian immigrants who were executed on probably false murder charges in the 1910s, uh, were anarchists, which is one of the reasons why they had so, <laughs> so little sympathy with, with, from the government. But anyway, so the people that generated this Yiddish culture, they were generally not religious, and they were left-leaning in terms of their causes. They also had a natural prejudice towards the shtetl, because the shtetl mentality they looked at as being backwards and weak. So the people who did generate the culture, they would you know, either make fun of or deride the shtetl experience. They felt that they were, I guess, now in a better place. Um, Jew Jewish recruits were used to help break up a strike. They, in, in some areas, they also helped w rights of the workers. Basically, Jews, as they moved along, in the even though they were subject to this harsh tenement life, they did become a little bit more politically active. And in that political activity came, quote-unquote, radicalism. Radicalism means being very, very strongly to one political side or the other. And Jewish radicalism in the, in the late 1800s typically meant being socialist or communist or anarchist, you know, something where against the establishment of the government. Many Jewish organizations did contribute to very strong left-wing causes. And there are many, many examples that we're going to discuss, but here are a few. First of all, you have the Pioneers of Liberty, a Jewish group organized way back. Um, to promote an artist political philosophy and was, of course, a left-wing organization. Apostasy and even atheism were essential philosophies to the Jewish radical left, which means that Jews who did promote these Generally, the socialist slash Zionist agenda was very, very much not a religious agenda. They looked at the religious with scorn and disdain, and they felt that religion didn't have a place in the in the I guess the Yiddish uh, extension of the culture. Uh, there were radical weekly papers like the Arbiter Zitung, if that's how you pronounce it, that was published in Chicago following the railroad strike. And they also, you know, as, as I mentioned before, they were also involved, these left-wing causes, not only anarchism and radicalism, but also in Zionism, which was the establishment of a Jewish state. Now, the, again, the, it's, it's a little ironic that they were anti-religious and yet for the establishment of the Jewish state, but that's because when they said Jewish, uh, they probably meant more culturally Jewish. You know, Yiddish speaking, Yiddish play, Yiddish thought, things like that, as opposed to anything to do with religion. And the migration of the Jews moving into New York caused some tremendous changes in these individuals. We've already discussed some of them, the weakening of their religious ties uh, and increasing political thought among them. But let's take a look at some of the other specific changes that were caused by the migration of Jews to the United States. First of all, the physical uprooting from long familiar setting of small town life in Eastern Europe to the urban areas in North America uh, was a huge change. They weren't used to, they were, they were used to more like the small town shtetls as opposed to the huge cities in New York. And that caused a severe rupture in the moral values and cultural support of Jewish religious communities. 
there was a much different social structure in the shtetl where people were used to supporting each other and with a strong sense of morality whereas in the city it was more like each person for himself things were so big that it, it decreased the sense of community Jews because of them having to work in the tenements very often were in the lower class and the working class lower working class areas and there were and other changes included really a decreased security from the shtetl. Yes, life in the shtetl was bad. It was subject to discrimination, poverty, um, the potential for pogroms, but at least the shtetl had some safety. At least it had the security of many generations of ancestors having lived in that shtetl. New York obviously had none. It wasn't as complex. Life didn't require special knowledge of the machines and technology which working in a sweatshop did. Where in the shtetl just didn't have didn't require that much education or knowledge. The shtetl encouraged taking time for oneself, one's family, and one's religion, whereas in New York, the long hours really did not. And the religious infrastructure was absent, of course, from American life. These are all themes that we've been discussing until now, but these are just some summaries. Now we're going to turn to a slightly different aspect of Jewish immigrant culture. We're going to look at the solidification of the immigrant communities. In other words, we're going to look at, once they've been established, what did they do? What kind of shape did the communities take in terms of the culture and the landmark in the United, of the United States? Okay, so as we got into the 20th century, past 1900, and the immigrants started being there for maybe an entire generation, started getting a little bit more affluent, worked a little harder, got better education, etc., um, the Jewish community started to slowly have an increase in its morale and its, I guess, sense of identity and uh, ability to do other things other than just trying to make ends meet. Just trying, you know, it had already made it here, now it was time to actually go do something beyond just making a bare subsistence. And so therefore, the Lower East Side and whatever other Jewish communities were at the, other, at the time started to generate things like social activities, which we'll discuss in more detail, political factions, political movements, which spawned, and again, we'll also discuss that in more detail, and collective programs, which means programs to assist each other, things that we might today call tzedakah organizations. Also, a middle class of Jewish immigrants started to develop. Not only did you have the working class poor that came over, people started to increase their or rise up a little bit in the ladder of the economy to become people that are more like the managers of the companies, uh, people in finance, uh, things like that. People could afford to stay, escape the ten tenements and some people could afford to, because they held jobs that were more lucrative and less brutal than working in the sweatshops, working in the factories. And this included things like, um, first of all, it just in any discussion of the immigrants you have to realize that this was not a one-time thing. It wasn't like all the immigrants t came over between 1880 and 1890, and then that was it. The spigot of immigrants from Eastern European, from Eastern Europe, from 1880, probably, and you know, Jewish immigrants from Eastern Europe, from 1880 all the way through World War II, never really shut off. It was just a matter of degree. <clears throat> and whereas some sometimes it was more than others, sometimes it was less, it was pretty consistent. But by the time that you had the turn of the century, uh, the time he had it after 1900, you know, 1906 over here was the peak, over 150,000 Jews arrived in one year, and more than a million came in the decade of the 1900s. But at that point, when he got into the 1900s and into the 1910s, many of the Jews had already been there since the 1880s, and you were already starting to see the second generation of immigrants. The children of the immigrants were now growing up, and they were benefiting economically from the sacrifice of the first generation. The first generation would work 16 hours in a sweatshop, and the second generation would have a little bit of a better opportunity to be educated in the culture and finances of the United States, and to do a little bit better. <clears throat> the quote-unquote, uh, the word greenhorn was an important goal. The greenhorn was somebody who was adjusted to American culture. And so the original immigrants, in other words, the, one that, the ones that came over in the 1880s, and their children, by the time 1910 rolled around, it was the new immigrants who had replaced them on the low end of the socio-economic ladder, and it was the older immigrants that moved up a little bit. So as normally happens, first you're an immigrant, then you come in, a generation later, all of a sudden you're the veteran, and the new guy's the immigrant.
And, okay, the next issue, and this is somewhat related, although a little bit of a different issue, uh, to the culture established by the immigrants, is the religious community and how they operated. Now, as I mentioned before, many of the people that came over were not religious, and many of the movements were not based on religion, but still, for the religious people that came over, they started to establish a kahila system, similar there are they want the the kahila system is really the way the shtetls worked where there was a central government there was a rabbi and they pretty much dominated the entire community it didn't really work to the same extent of the united states i mean as we'll see they did they did have shuls and rabbis etc but they did not have the same level of central governance you know in the in the shtetl uh, the rabbi was able to say pretty much anything and everybody had to listen to the rabbi there really was no other choice the immigrants were a little reluctant to have that same system here. First of all, because negative experience in Europe with community leadership uh, was a factor. The shtetl didn't always work out very well from an economic perspective. And also, this was more Americanization. You know, in the United States, there, it's much more of each individual for himself rather than a such a tight-knit community. So although Jews did form central organizations and shuls, there was no real central governance structure of the communities. And by the way, of course, that still remains to this day. In the United States, you don't really have in American Jewish communities, with the exception of certain Hasidic communities, of course, uh, you don't really have central governing structures. You don't really necessarily have, um, you know, a central Besden that really has the authority to govern over everybody. Uh, the, the idea of a more centralized structure where one group, one person, one rabbi has the authority to govern everybody, that's more the shtetl model. So the next issue I want to turn to is, I guess, the struggles of the Jewish community. There were a lot of good points about the early part of the Jewish community in America, and of course there were some difficult points as well. Uh, there, there, this is about the frustration that occurred in the Jewish community. There was the the incident at Rabbi Yaakov Yosef's funeral, you know, that RJJ is named after, in case you're not familiar with it. It's a school in Manhattan. But in any case, at his funeral, uh, which was a very famous, very beloved rabbi, uh, as they were walking through the streets during the procession, during the funeral procession, factory workers were sticking their heads out the window and yelling anti-Semitic phrases and throwing things at the procession. And the Jewish mourners obviously were very frustrated by this, and they were very unhappy by this, and they stormed into the buildings and attacked the people who, and ran up the stairs and attacked the people who were throwing the things and hurling the anti-Semitic epithets. There was also a riot that occurred in the dispute between Jewish retail butchers and wholesale butchers. Um, that was again the there was a there there was a, again a whole long story. I'm not going to go into it, but there was work work disputes that that occurred between Jews and other Jews, between Jews and Gentiles. Street peddlers held felt that they were being uh, harassed by the police, and they held uh, protests over it. Um, and there were. The, the this was part of the you know there's also a tremendous concern over the fate of the Jews who were stuck back home. That's why uh, it says over here the German Jews and Russian Jews put aside their differences to to protest news of pogroms. Sorry, it should be pogroms, not programs, but pogroms, and petitioned the government to do what it could for the Jews of Eastern Europe. So I mean there were a lot of reasons for the Jews in the New York communities to be ill at ease as well. The incident with anti-Semitism of the co-workers, internal disputes, economic disputes, uh, street salespeople being harassed by the police, and of course news of problems with the Eastern European Jews uh, back, back in Eastern Europe. But as they moved along, and as you know, it became 1910s, 1920s, etc., they became their they became more integrated into American culture. Uh, most Jews of this era, as I mentioned, you know, really stopped being Orthodox and started to assimilate into an American culture. And more stores, as this the 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 time period came on, more more and more Jewish owned stores started to stay open on Shabbos. However, Jewish immigrants of all stripes, in other words, of all backgrounds, of all uh, economic class got together to start certain Jewish institutions, Beth Israel Hospital, uh, Hebrew Free Loan Society, which was an all 
uh, which was an all Jewish credit union, an all Jewish bank. And there were many, there, there would be many of these such organizations, tzedakah organizations, hospitals, banks, credit unions, things like that. Uh, so even though most Jews assimilated into American culture at this time, they also stuck together to the point that they helped establish and maintain uh, Jewish organizations to help the Jewish community. And during this time, their Lower East Side started to spread out a little bit, or I, should, I shouldn't say the Lower East Side. The Jewish community in, in New York started to spread out a little bit. Originally, it was pretty much the Lower East Side and a few little tendrils here and there and various other points. But then, as the first generation of immigrants grew up and moved out, and as they became a little bit wealthier and able to move out of the tenements, the, there naturally arose different Jewish communities around New York City. Uh, first of all, some arose in Brooklyn. There were bridges and tunnels that were built in the late 1800s and early 1900s across the East River. The Brooklyn Bridge, Manhattan Bridge, Williamsburg Bridge. And more affluent communities sprung up further, uh, further uptown, like in Harlem and in other parts of in the Upper East Side. Uh, also, some Jewish communities, including Brownsville and Williamsburg, remained a hotbed of Orthodox Judaism, um, even when the Lower East Side Judaism were, were le practicing less and less. So many Orthodox people actually moved out to these other communities which became Orthodox enclaves because of the fact that the Lower East Side became more and more secular. However, of course, even to this day, many people remain on the Lower East Side. Uh, in those days, it was because they were probably closer to their jobs. Today, well, I guess the Lower East Side has had a little, little bit of a resurgence in recent years. Uh, just to give you a little bit of an idea of what we're talking about, this is uh, a map of New York. I think we looked at this a few minutes ago as well. Uh, this is New York City. This, as we mentioned before, is the Lower East Side. And as you can see, there are now, and have been for a long time, three crossings of the East River. This body of water here is the East River. And you have the Brooklyn Bridge, which is this one, and you have the Manhattan Bridge, which is this one, and you have the Williamsburg, which is this one. And as these bridges and tunnels went up, it became much more convenient. You know, people didn't have cars in the, for, the, for the most part in those days. Uh, and the cars really didn't become common until the 1920s and 1930s. Uh, but people, it was much easier to walk or to take you know, public transportation uh, if across the across the river because of these bridges. So even though you had the um, the Lower East Side over here, you had communities in Brooklyn which sprung up. Here is Williamsburg, as you can see. This is the Williamsburg Bridge. This area is Williamsburg, Brooklyn, which of course remains a Hasidic Jewish community. There's Brownsville, which is uh, you can see Brownsville over there. Where's Brownsville? Right there. Um, with a little A, because I just searched for it. That's a little bit further into Brooklyn, you can see that. And, you know, there are other Jewish communities that developed, Crown Heights, of course. Uh, eventually, much later on, you had communities like Bar Park and Flatbush, which is somewhere around here. Well, they call it Flatlands, but this area is approximately where Flatbush is today. Um, those also became Jewish communities. And then you also had Jewish communities further up in Manhattan. Instead of just the Lower East Side, which is over here, you had the Upper East Side, which is way up here. This area is Midtown, and this is the Upper East Side. This area is Harlem, which of course now is primarily an African-American community, but in those days, many Jews lived there as well. And although Jews did not want a centralized structure, a centralized government, you know, the shtetl mentality, which we discussed a few minutes ago, there still was a need for some level of community. Uh, there, there still was a need for some getting together of the communities to make sure that they provide for the current interest. There was a, uh, a, a mayor, a police commissioner in New York named Theodore Bingham who made some brutally anti-Semitic comments, anti-Jewish comments in 1909. And because of that, just the idea that there were people from outside the community that didn't like the Jewish community, that spurred an effort of the community itself to become a little, little bit more structured. So the goal of the central community would be to reduce confusion, desperation, and crime among the Jewish immigrants. And so although Jewish immigrants were not overly enthralled with the idea of a Jewish central government, the, they, they did form these authorities, but of course the authorities didn't really gain control. I mean, if, you, if, you're, if, you're, if it's confusing, just think about something like 
in today's day and age. Most Jewish communities, you might have organizations that get together to try to uh, establish unity among the community, especially if there's there's a danger, or especially if there's perceived anti-Semitism going on. Very often, communities will get together, but communities don't always uh, act in concert because people don't want other people to govern their lives. That's pretty much the way it was then, and that's pretty much the way it was today as well. Now we move to the subject of Jewish life as the Jews continued to prove, improve their position economically. And the first is the issue of Jewish banks. Jewish-owned banks became very popular in the early 1900s as the Jews grew out of their immigrant status. Joseph Marcus founded the Public National Bank, which was followed by many other Jewish-owned banks and credit unions. This was an era in which banks were not really regulated. Today you have a lot of financial banking regulation. In those days you really didn't, especially this is before the Great Depression and the securities laws that were passed during the Great Depression. And therefore, banks were a lot more susceptible to panics. And that's really what happened. Uh, when During the early era of these Jewish banks running, what had happened was there were times where there were rumors of, of unsoundness. In other words, rumors of that a bank was not in good financial position. And when that would happen, generally speaking, when you had rumors of unsoundness in a bank, then what? Then all the customers would start to panic and start to wonder, is this bank going under? And then they would go and what they call make a banking run, which means they want to go run to the bank and try to withdraw their money. These were before the days of doing transactions online, obviously. And because of the fa that, whenever there was a problem, and whenever there were even small little issues, that could cause a snowball effect that could cause the entire bank to fail. And that caused many of these banks to run out of assets and fail. And after these incidents, Jewish-owned small banks became much less common. Jews continued to participate in the general banking industry, but Jewish-owned banks became less common. They were more susceptible to attacks. People who, you know, who were against Jews in general could get at the Jewish owners through the banking system, and basically the experiment of the Jewish-owned bank did not work out too well. What did work out pretty well is the middle-class Jewry, sometimes referred to as the bourgeois. As the second generation of Jewish immigrants progressed, more and more wealthy Jews bought and operated successful businesses. These included Samuel Silverman, who had an estimated wor net worth of $500,000, which in those days was a lot of money, Meyer Johnson and Company, Maris, Harris Mandelbaum. These are all examples of early, early immigrant society where you still had relatively high class, middle class, middle, high middle class Jewry that was able to do well, even while there, many other Jewish immigrants were still suffering in the tenements of the Lower East Side. Next, I want to turn to the culture of the Jewish immigrants. We've been discussing economics and the experience, the, uh, the economic experience in terms of how they were able to provide ends meet, but now I want to look at the cultural experience of the Jewish immigrants. Even though, as I mentioned before, religion did not constitute a huge part of Jewish immigrant life, there were still traditional Jewish culture that did provide the basis for Jewish immigrant life. There was not that much aristocracy. In other words, there was not there were there wasn't much in terms of you know upper class uh, people with fancy manners and fancy uh, you know decorative houses and things like that. Even the middle class Jewry generally frowned on that sort of thing. High culture or artificial manners were absent or frowned upon in the Jewish area. The central structure of the of Jewish culture was the family. First of all, families were tight-knit in space and emotionally. Remember, very often they, their extended family may have been overseas, so the only thing they really had there was the immigrant family. Uh, they were also, of course, very close physically, because very often they lived in the tenements. And also, there was also a culture of helping families in the old country and new immigrants who were extended family members. Okay, and it, was, it wasn't uncommon for large families to share single rooms and for children to have to sleep in the kitchen or the living room. Um, and another thing that happened because of the fact that very often the jobs took 15, 16 hours a day and there wasn't a tremendous amount of family time for the breadwinners, for the fathers, mothers often became the spiritual backbone of the family.
that segues into our discussion of the roles of the women. Although male authority and modesty principles, principles of Tznius, were still a part of Jewish society, the fact of the matter is that because the fathers were out 15, 16 hours a day working in, working in the sweatshop, the mother had to fill a bunch of different roles. Bargain hunter. She had to go out and make sure that the family was able to buy food and other necessities at relatively good prices. Managing the household, managing the finances of the household, and even teaching the religious and uh, teaching uh, teaching the children both religious and secular concepts. Obviously, there were public schools, there were malamdim, um, but when it came, to, but the mother had to really take the lead in educating the children because the father really wasn't always around to do so. <coughs> that sometimes leads to the quote-unquote the stereotypical Jewish mother that you hear sometimes they say that 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 could have been part of what formed it the idea of the Jewish mother being very interested in the family and involved in the day-to-day -day activities of the children and just being kind of a dominant figure in the family is a stereotype that persists to this very day and a lot of it had to do with the fact that the women had to assume that roles because the fathers may not have been around to do so in the early part of the 20th century after the immigrants came over from Europe. Next is the issue of the social arrangements. How did the people in the immigrant communities socialize with each other? Well, first of all, borders became very part, very people who lived in other people's houses for for you know in exchange for helping pay the rent. Uh, these certainly was it were a big part of any family's social structure. They were very often honest people, but sometimes they were vis dishonest people, and people were constantly afraid of taking borders because of the possibility of the border taking advantage of his or her host. Um, although they very often economically didn't have a choice. Husbands, also there was a problem that the husbands deserting their family was a dangerous possibility. People, husbands very often had to leave their families for long periods of time, either leave them in Europe or leave them to go to different parts of uh, the country. And there, the danger of them leaving because they found something else in a different area was always a risk and always a possibility. And also, uh, the, there was also a generational conflict. Now, there's always a genera generational conflict, but this is especially true in the first generation of immigrants. When the children were growing up, the children would tend to have a very different culture than their parents. Their parents more the European culture, the children more the American culture. Also, the, the children who were subjected to difficult school days, dual curriculum between learning Torah and learning secular studies. Uh, you know, they had to go to public school and then the Talmud Torah at night, very often when they grew up, they were reluctant to continue with that, and so they became less religious. Um, and, of course, they had less respect for their parents because they didn't look at them as part of the American culture. One thing that the immigrants did do is they established really guilds that were that were known as the Landsmannschaften, or the Landsmannschaften. The Landsmannschaften were lodges made of people that came from the same town or district in the old country. You know, people from, let's say, for example, the Minsk area uh, in Belarus would get together and form a... Um, would form a guild, would form a, kind of a society, an organization, a social club. Uh, they would meet in synagogues or other community centers, and they would catch up with people with similar backgrounds. But they became much more than that. You know, so far it sounds like it's just kind of a, you know, a nightclub. Well, it became much more than that. It became highly sophisticated social organizations. These landsmanschaften were critical to the people. Um, they very often they collected dues, and they used those dues to pay for people who were in need. It was almost like a charitable organization. It would actually regulate marriages within its members. It would, re it would make sure that, uh, you know, it would, it, would sustain, it would set up marriages, it would approve marriages. It would also collect dues to pay certain community spending and to send money back to the old country. It even focused, it even worked as collective insurance, where everybody would pay a certain amount, and then if anybody needed money because of a death or because of a lost job or whatever it was, they would be able to, um, they would be able to pay it from the funds from the treasury of the landsmanschaft in which everybody would contribute to. It was kind of a form of social security long before the actual social security, which didn't come until the 1930s, uh, existed. So the landsmanschaft were a very important point, not only of social awareness, but also of just kind of helping each other in the immigrant communities.
The shul, of course, also had a very important impact on Jewish society. Even though a majority of immigrant families became less observant, the shul it didn't have the same level of impact as it as it um, as it did in Eastern Europe, but it still was an important component of life in early immigrant society. Ordinary immigrants at the beginning usually went to shul uh, several times, even when they became less religious. Maybe they only went to shul on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, but a daily minyanim, of course, became much less common as people became less and less observant. Still, even the people that didn't come to shul very much, uh, they did have shuls that were established with rabbis and cantors and uh, chazanim, and these were excellent jobs. Rabbi and cantor were excellent jobs because they paid pretty nice salaries, and of course, they didn't, you, know, you wouldn't have to work in a sweatshop. You wouldn't have to go out and get a job in the economy and work your way up in a factory or a business. You could do something that was you know, relatively painless and make these decent salaries. There were organizations like the Young Israel Organization, which of course persists to this very day, that would try to combine religion with a modern lifestyle and offer cultural benefits in addition to davening. And of course the Young Israel is a modern Orthodox movement and there were other movements as well that were similar that would try to help people integrate religion with culture within the immigrant community. The idea of Zionism also grew in the immigrant community. Zionism, of course, was founded in Europe in the late 1800s, the idea of establishing a Jewish nation. But that also started to gain a foothold in New York. And again, even among people that were not religious, in fact, especially among people that were not religious, the idea of a Jewish homeland uh, grew dramatically. Uh, as of 1905, there were 25,000 members in Zionist groups probably more than there are today <laughs> in New York. Aside from supporting a political Jewish home state, Zionists also um, participated in politics, in education, in philosophy. Zionist movements, you know, today we don't really think of it as being such a powerful movement, really just being based in Israel, but before the state of Israel started, Zionism was a very important political movement in the United States and among Jewry in general. And many other many other Jews, on the other hand, were opposed to Zionism. It's interesting that the opponents of Zionism came from both ends of the political spectrum. You had the people who were very religious, very often didn't didn't like the idea of Zionism because of you know the famous idea that we shouldn't try to get a homeland in Eretz Israel before Mashiach comes. And then you had people on the other side, the more liberal Jews, who felt that Zionism was wrong because it's wrong to try to establish a country based on something like religion. Now let's move to something, let's move to recreation. The book goes through this, an interesting, it has some interesting pictures actually. Um, how did Jews in the early 1900s entertain themselves? Well, in the cities themselves, you had some places where people could let off a little steam. You had saloons and bars. They didn't like, Jews didn't go there that much and they didn't like to spend very much, so they weren't considered very good customers in the bars, but nevertheless they were still available. Candy shops, which of course were very common, especially among children, uh, really through the 1950s and 60s. Large halls were established for weddings or social dances. Certainly that was a big part of recreation for the uh, immigrants. And slightly more affluent Jews very often uh, they sought living arrangements that were closer to parks, like Central Park or Prospect Park in Brooklyn, based on the idea that they would use these parks for recreation. We sometimes take, take parks for granted, but people in the tenements uh, very often did not have a park available at all to go to. And so the idea of living near a park, living near an open space, was something that was a lot more... Um, that was a lot more common. That was a lot. That was something that was very uh, was a was a luxury for people who could afford it. In the summertime, even as early as the early 1900s, a Jew started to escape to the Catskill Mountains. Ad you saw advertisements for Jewish hotels in the Catskills. Uh, the locals in the Catskills weren't always thrilled about the Jews coming during the summer, and perhaps this, a lot of applies to the, to the same extent today. Today, you don't have as many kosher hotels. You don't have as many big kosher resorts. You have very few, as a matter of fact. Um, but in the early 1900s, when flights were very expensive and people couldn't just go to Las Vegas or Florida for vacation so easily, people would go up to the Catskills, and you'd have enormous numbers of Jews going up 
up to the Catskills during the summer and other parts of the, parts of the year. Of course, today it, it is still it's still very common to go to the to go to the Catskills for the summer, but maybe the hotels are maybe not quite as common. And finally, the last issue in this chapter is the issue of just some also basic customs that were applied in Jewish communities. The custom of the matchmaker to help to charge and earn a fee for matchmaking. Um, they and also wedding to conduct weddings and funerals were also were also done traditionally. Basically, the, the weddings and funerals were two things that even among the non-religious were handled in a traditional way. You know, many things they might not come to shul, they might not do other things that were religious. When it came to getting mar getting married and when it came to dying and mourning, um, even the non-religious tended to stick to traditional customs. And in addition to those two things, the non-religious also maintain certain cultural Jewish things, such as retelling of historical Jewish stories and many songs that were from Eastern Europe. A little later on, we'll discuss the various other cultural and Jewish literature. But in addition, certain things like Jewish stories and songs from Europe made inroads and maintained in the, even in the secular Jewish community. And now we're going to keep looking at life in the Jewish immigrant communities, specifically at the education of the children in those communities. First of all, in terms of the quote-unquote Jewish ghettos, which were the areas in which were primarily Jews, areas of course like the Lower East Side, uh, Brownsville and Williamsburg and Brooklyn, areas in maybe a little bit in Harlem in some at some points. In these areas, the street had a very key role as the main gathering place on a day-to-day -day basis. There wasn't that much in terms of parks and in terms of recreation, so the street was really a critical area for the for the for the children and for the and for the adults as well. You had street vendors selling all sorts of Judaica uh, and and other wares, push carts that were selling food. Children would play ball or open fire hydrants to you know to get wet in the summer. Um, there were docks by the river, by the East River, where the children would go swimming in the summer. And these were sometimes referred to as the street children because their lives revolved around the activities in the streets. Now, the relationship with the between parents and children of the early immigrants is something that I alluded to before, but it's a very important point. And that is, first of all, parents were very worried that American culture would cause their children to go off the path of traditional Judaism, whether for religious reasons or even for non-religious reasons, they were worried that the addition Jewish culture from Eastern Europe would be lost. They often pushed their children hard academically and religiously as well. Now, on the other hand, the children very often didn't have quite the level of respect for their parents because their parents were from the old country, they probably spoke with accents, they didn't speak English very well, uh, they didn't have the same level of American cultural awareness, and sometimes parents were almost embarrassments to their children who were who were who grew up more in American society. And of course, parents were often afraid that the children would end up in street gangs and engage in destructive behavior. So that was, you know, there was a very tense relationship among the early immigrants between the parents and the children. Now, the girls had a much different role in the in New York Jewish communities than girls had had and in the European communities. First of all, secular and even secular society at the time, and certainly Jewish society at the time, expected the gir girls to essentially prepare for motherhood and for marriage. Um, the European culture had often fostered a sense of inferiority on women, and the expectation was, even in secular culture at the time, that women's main job was to grow up and get married and have children. However, in the ghetto, in the Jewish communities, the rules were a little different. Unmarried girls would often get jobs as typists or shop girls and work other long hours and low pay work. You know, before they got married, they would spend, you know, they would spend basically their time working in the city in sweatshops or other places like the married men would. Um, and so therefore, if they, they could live with their parents, they didn't make a lot of money to have their own place, so either they would live with their parents or they would be forced to room with other similarly situated girls. There are some examples given in the book about American Jewish girls and young women who wrote novels with Jewish heroines um, that helped give a sense of hope and excitement 
to young Jewish women. Certainly there was a much different role for the girls than there was under the traditional rule. Girls were much more involved in working, they were involved in producing culture, etc. In terms of going to school, well I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but this, so this will be a little bit of a review. There wasn't that much in terms of Jewish day schools in the early part of the 20th century, in the late 1800s and early 1900s, even Orthodox children, even religious children, were forced to go to public schools. The teachers in these public schools were usually not Jewish. They were often I Irish. They did have respect for the plight of immigrants in general, since, of course, the Irish themselves, only a couple of generations earlier, were immigrants to New York. So they did sympathize with the Jewish children, even though sometimes they were condescending to the Jewish students. Remember, the Jewish students were a couple of generations later, their parents didn't have the same level of Americanized culture, and so there was some condescension towards them, but at least the teachers were a little sympathetic. Now, the parents, and this is something, of course, that's a Jewish tradition pretty much everywhere, the this is something that Jews have always put a premium on, and that is education. Jewish students were driven to excel in secular education as well, even when they didn't have the same level of background and the same level of resources as the parents did. Parents always pushed their children to try to do as well as possible in schooling. And also, the Jewish children had a little bit of an advantage um, of in the public schools, because the public schools were filled with immigrants from everywhere. New York was an immigrant city, especially in the 1800s. It was filled with immigrants of everyone, and that made it a little easier for the Jewish children to fit in because of the fact that every, you know, most of the people there were immigrants. So, in fact, because there were, there were so many Jews in New York and they took up school districts, very often there were public schools that were mostly Jews. Now, obviously, these schools still taught only secular studies. They didn't teach religious studies, but still, it was there were school districts that were very, you know, that were very, very heavily Jewish. Just as a side note, this has nothing to do with what we're, what we're discussing. I remember reading a column in the Jewish Press by Arnold Fine, who was, uh, you know, I guess he grew up in the early part of the 20th century, so he grew up in these kinds of schools, and he told a story about how on Chol Moed Pesach, when he'd uh, when he'd come to school, there would be like the 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 smell of of butter and eggs because all the children would have matzah they wouldn't have regular sandwiches they would have matzah with butter and eggs and the the butter would seep out of the sandwiches and leak out of people's briefcase and so the butter would the it would the, the hole would be thick with the stench of the of the sandwiches uh, <coughs> And the reason for that is because the school might have been, might have been 85 or 90 percent Jewish, uh, even though, of course, it was a public school. And even those Jewish children who were new and didn't speak English very well, they were assisted in acclimating themselves uh, by the other Jewish students who were already, you know, who, who, who had already been there for a while. And, as is typical of Jews also throughout history, Jewish students, even with their relatively weak background, uh, turned out to be very, very strong students and were academic overachievers uh, even in the public school system. And that eventually made its way to the university system. Uh, immigrant, immigrant Jews after the First World War in the 20s and 30s started flowing into the university system. Again, these were the children of the immigrants, uh, very often sometimes even children of the second generation immigrants, and once they would go through the public schools, then they, would, they filled up the City University of New York system. So City College was actually, um, well, City College wasn't as much of a four-year university, but it was a kind of a mix between high school and college. There were, and it had open admissions policies, and Jews really filled up, the sons of the children of the immigrants filled up the, uh, filled up City College. And even though City College had maintained a Christian tone, a Protestant tone, that changed with the greater number of Jewish students. And and, of course, Jews tried very hard and were pushed very hard to their parents to do well. And after that, uh, in accordance with the priorities of Jewish society, the students typically focused more on academic skills. The debating team of City University of New City College was stronger, I guess, than the... Uh, football team, or actually, interestingly enough, I know this, again, a little bit of a tangent, uh, City College was actually one, the last city, the last school in New York, uh, the last school in New York City to win a NCAA basketball tournament. This is back in the 50s. I think they had some Jewish players on their team. But overall, it was still a matter of academic excellence was the major goal for the Jewish immigrants and their children.
Now we move into chapter 9, entitled Jewish Labor, Jewish Socialism. This, of course, is about the Jewish involvement in the political movement of socialism. Socialism, as I mentioned earlier, is the political philosophy essentially saying that the workers should control the businesses and that everybody should make approximately equal amount of money rather than having some people make a lot of money and some people make very little. Because the Jews were typically workers, they naturally sympathized with the workers and with socialism in general, and socialism did make tremendous inroads in the Jewish community in the early 20th century. So in the early 1900s, many, Jewish, many Jews were socialists, and most Jews were in the working class. Uh, still, organized socialism at the time, in other words, really organizing into parties, didn't really work, didn't, wasn't kind of non-existent. First of all, because Jewish workers didn't, didn't have the time to organize and, and get involved into politics. They were having to work with their family. Also, in a country so large as the United States, the immigrant Jews didn't really have any illusions of influencing the whole country. It's one thing, you know, if you have 100, over 100 million people in the country, uh, the Jews realized that just a few Jews were not really going to be able to influence the American political system. Even Jewish labor unions, and there were, labor unions were groups of workers that tried to negotiate with the companies for a better deal. Uh, they did relatively little in terms of striking and fighting against the capitalist business owners, which is very often what other unions did. Jewish socialism did become more organized when working class proletariat Jews, in other words, working Jews became more affluent. They got better jobs, they became managers, and thus they had more time and energy to, uh, to organize. Now, still, even though, as we'll see, there were many exceptions, the socialist movement never really gained complete currency among the Jewish people. And aside from the reasons I discussed earlier, there are other reasons for that as well. First of all, Jewish socialists themselves were often defined by dogmatism. In other words, they were socialists because they believed philosophically in the rights of the worker rather than the practical needs of the masses. And so the masses weren't really interested in philosophy. They were just interested in making things as comfortable as possible for themselves. Also, hard work was within the Jewish spirit and attitude. And therefore, the idea that the workers should strike and the workers should demand better conditions was a little bit anathema to the general Jewish attitude that hard work is good. And the other thing was is that most of the socialist movements were either irreligious or anti-religious. And even though most of the Jews also were not religious at the time, they still were not anti-religious, and it was difficult for them to oppose religion. Still, Jewish socialist movements did and would spring up in communities in New York and Chicago in the Jewish communities. A common example of a Jewish socialist movement was Bundism. Bundism was a Jewish socialist movement that originated in Europe, and its philosophy included Marxism, which is really communism, based, which is based on the idea that the workers should control the means of production, the workers should control companies, and the workers should basically keep whatever they make, and not the capitalist uh, owners should not make profits. It was also based on secularism, which means non-religion, of course, and Yiddishism. Yiddishism, kind of a strange word, means totally apart from religion, having nothing to do with religion, the preservation of Yiddish as, as a language and the preservation of Jewish culture, Yiddish culture. Uh, you know, like, the, for example, they might approve things like uh, putting on plays that were written by Shalom Aleichem, even though they would not necessarily uh, agree with studying Torah or anything to that effect. They're sometimes referred to as Zionists with seasickness. I thought that was a cute little quote in the book. The reason why they call, they call them Zionists with seasickness is because Zionism had a lot of these other things. Zionism is very, Zionists who wanted to go to Israel and form a Jewish state, uh, they were Marxist or socialist, many of them. They were also secularists, which means they were, not, they were anti-religion. And also they wanted to preserve Jewish culture and a Jewish homeland. So Bundists and Zionists are very similar, but I I guess they're called Zionists with seasickness because they didn't want to go by sea all the way to Israel. They would rather just form their Jewish culture, their their uh, the same basic principles uh, over here rather than going all the way to Israel to do it. Now, the Bundists did have some success in New York. First of all, this was a philosophy and a movement with origins in Europe, so they did have some experience organizing people and, and getting converts to their cause. And in Europe, they had been aggressively put down by the governments who saw them as threats. But in the U.S., since there was freedom of speech and there, there was no, there, the government wasn't going to put them down, they 
they couldn't be outlawed or punished by the government, and so therefore, with their experience in working in Europe, they were able to do pretty well in recruiting Jews to follow their cause. Okay, now with our continue discussion of Jewish socialism, we go to Jewish socialism and the role of women. Women also had an important role, of course, both in the workforce and in the political movements of the Jewish immigrant society. You had the International Ladies' Garment Workers' Union, which was a labor union, of course, that tried to get better working conditions in the garment workers. It was organized in 1900. It struggled at first because different people at the top had different um, ideas of what it should, what its ultimate goal should be. But by 1909, it had its strength. It actually had 20,000 members, and they organized a strike in the shirtwaist business. And the strike lasted for months and was settled with improvements in working conditions. And they also organized another strike in the cloak industry, the coat making industry, in 1910. And so the this organization, which was of Jewish women workers, uh, did actually had did have some success. Uh, the there all these many different Jewish unions theoretically were supposed to be at peace with uh, with the Jewish businesses, but it didn't always work out. In other words, the strikes theoretically were supposed to be leveled at non-Jewish owned business, but even between Jewish workers and Jewish owned businesses there were some problems. And the problems between the workers and businesses really came to a head in the Triangle Shirt Fire. The Triangle Shirt Fire is one of the one of the most terrible tragedies that happened in New York in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, there was a huge there was a huge uh, basically a sweatshop, Triangle Shirt Waist Company. Uh, in 1911, there was a fire in it and. Um, it killed 146 people, um, even though it was really, it was a fire. I mean, obviously a fire is dangerous, but the the, the conditions and the fact that everybody was so t packed together, and there was actually some, I once saw a special on it, that, that they, they thought that perhaps the doors might have been locked from the outside to prevent the sweatshop workers from getting out during normal conditions and during the fire the, the doors weren't opened and people actually burnt as the as they couldn't get out because the doors were locked. I mean a terrible horrific tragedy. Uh, most of the women, most of the people who died in that fire were women and many of them were Jewish or Italian women who were working in these sweatshops and the deaths were attributable to extremely cramped conditions and very poor exiting conditions. Because of this there were tremendous protests and that helped generate the emergence of the immigrant Jewish working class in America and these movements that tried to help establish better conditions for workers in general. And of course the Jewish working class in the um, in the United States, which was most of the immigrants, they had certain characteristics. First of all, they had lack of experience at unified workers in Europe. It's not like when they came over from Europe they had a tremendous amount of experience striking and forming unions. In Europe there basically were no unions. They also were uprooted from their religious traditions of Europe and their customary work and their culture. And that's one of the things that isolated the unions. Also, the union the Jewish unions had very different characteristics from other unions you know there were many different types of unions dock workers unions all sorts of uh, type pipefitters unions. I mean there are all sorts sorts of different types of unions there still are but the Jewish unions were very different than the than the non-Jewish unions that prevailed throughout the country and the difference really was that while general unions, while well, non-Jewish unions typically focused on bread and butter issues, you know, working conditions and salaries, Jewish unions also focused more on society-wide issues, like social security and insurance for people who were hurt or sick, housing and education, cultural activity, all things that may not have anything to do specifically with work, but were very important to the Jewish community in general. And because of that, the Jewish unions engaged in many different extracurricular activities including things like um, helping people who were down and out. They bar Borrowing this from the Jewish concept of tzedakah, the unions had a true sense of communal responsibility. They felt responsible for the community as a whole. Uh, they established the custom of contributing to other unions 
and many social and communal agencies. Jewish unions who had dues would contribute it to other unions of workers and people who needed it. For example, during the Great Steel Strike of 1919, which was led by non-Jewish unions, Jewish unions contributed $175,000 to the, to the strikers, which was half of all of the contributions of the entire country that came from the Jewish unions in New York. Uh, union meetings were very often held in Yiddish and reflected Jewish values. Again, even though this was n these, they were not particularly religious. It really was a blend of social radicalism and cultural romanticism. I like that phrase the book uses. Social radicalism means, again, trying to change the social structure and improve the lot of the lower class and the worker, and also based on culture. However, Jews... Jewish unions, although they did some good work, were undermined and never really got in full, in full swing, really because of the fact that the goal of the Jewish work, worker was never to stay and make things good for the worker permanently. The goal of the Jewish worker typically was to eventually become a manager. You know, whereas other non-Jewish unions might say, well, you know, we're always going to be working for the union, so we want to make things as good as possible, the Jewish workers always felt that, you know, I'll work in the union, I'll work, I'll work as, until I can become a manager, and then I'll move up in life. And because of that, the Jewish unions may never have reached the same level of critical mass as some other non-Jewish unions did. Now let's move to a discussion of the socialist upsurge in Jewish politics. Jewish, Jews had been involved in socialist principles in general, but in the 1910s, and in actually probably until about 1919-1920, uh, Jews were very active in socialist politics. In the 1910s, really, you know, through World War I, uh, the socialism was was stronger in the United States than it ever had been before that, and probably since uh, uh, it's harder than it's ever been since then as well. Jewish socialists worked in many worked in many areas. Um, the union movement. In addition, in, aside from just organizing unions and strikes, socialists also played a part in election campaigns. Um, at first, the socialist parties did so only to get publicity, but eventually the socialist parties in New York that were backed by the Jewish um, immigrants actually did fairly well and, and had a chance to win at certain times. Um, in New York, there was an organization, I should mention, it's called Tammany Hall. Tammany Hall, uh, if you're unfamiliar with New York history, is really a political organization that dominated New York City politics, starting probably in the mid-1800s and running all the way through the 1930s. Uh, Tammany Hall was a group of people that met at, I guess, they had a headquarters at Tammany Hall, I guess. But either way, Tammany Hall were part Democratic Party operatives that dominated New York City politics more or less. And because of the power of Tammany Hall, obviously this made this made much this made it much more difficult for outsider organizations like socialists to break into the New York City power structure. In addition, the fact that these socialist organizations were run by Jews meant that it would be run it would be met with at least a little bit of hostility from other people. However, there were a couple of Jewish socialists who did very well uh, in terms of New York City politics. For, um, Morris Hillquit uh, was a prominent Jewish socialist. He ran for Congress in the Democratic primary in 1906 and scored actually 26% of the vote in the primary in 1906. He eventually went in 1908, ran again, and scored 21%. Uh, he, Morris Hillquit, really lacked a strong feeling for Yiddish culture, and he believed in socialist principles, but not necessarily anything related to Jewish principles. The successful politician in, social, in Jewish socialist history was Meyer London. Meyer London ran in 1910 and gathered 33% of the vote, and in, then in 1914 he got 47% of the vote in a multi-party race, and he was elected to Congress. He was elected to Congress uh, and as a socialist. He was one of the few socialists in the history of the United States to be elected to Congress as a socialist. Uh, Bernie Sanders from Vermont is a recent person who was elected to Congress and eventually the Senate, but Meyer London was a Jewish socialist who was elected from New York in 1914 to Congress. World War I presented a little bit of a dilemma 
to the Jewish socialists. First of all, socialists in general opposed World War One. Socialists in general are opposed to war. The world wars, at least in the socialist, Marxist, communist outlook, uh, is the idea that capitalist countries are fighting each other to seize markets, and etc., etc. And socialists therefore opposed World War One. But on the other hand, um, once World War One happened, even the socialists wanted to avoid painting themselves as being unpatriotic and against the war effort. So even though Meyer London argued against the United States entry into World War I, once the United States did enter into war, London's political support to uh, at the anti-war position really began to evaporate. Um, some people felt that he was not anti-war enough, the people who were real socialists, and some people felt that he was too anti-war, and that therefore he was unpatriotic. Other Jewish socialists also started doing well in New York City politics, but that really ended. The power of the Jewish socialists, socialists and socialists in general really ended with the quote-unquote Red Scare. Twice in history, the American people have become very, very nervous and very disenchanted with communists and socialism and strong movements against them. You might have heard of the second one, which happened in the 1950s under Senator Joseph McCarthy's hearings, um, where the, he, the, the Red Scare of the 1950s, but there was also a Red Scare in 1919 and 1920, where socialists and communists were very strongly um, condemned and hated by the American people in general, and that's kind of what brought down the power of the Jewish socialist movement uh, as well during that era. Next, I want to continue with our discussion of Jews and politics with a look at the other issue of Jewish party politics. In other words, Jews did sympathize with the socialist movement and contribute to the socialist movement. But what about with the relationship to the two major American parties? And those are, of course, the Republicans and the Democrats. Even back then, the Republicans and Democrats were the two major parties in the United States. Uh, the Jews were generally very slow to enter the arena of classical party politics for a few reasons. First of all, uh, Jews from Poland and Russia, especially in Eastern Europe in general, they feared the state. They feared the state and the state's political apparatus because, of course, the state didn't treat the Jews very well in Europe. And so even when they came to the United States and didn't have the same level of fear, because of ingrained tendencies, Jews were not particularly anxious to join the political machines, to join, to join the political arena. Also, secular Jews often went through third-party movements rather than Republican or Democrats, such as the Socialist Party. Um, affluent Jews who immigrated in the 1800s, like, for example, German Jews, uh, very often went with the Republican Party, because in those days in general, the uh, Republicans, of course, started as the anti-slavery party. The Republicans were more the party of the North, and the Democrats were the party of the South, but also the Republicans were the party of business, and the Democrats were a little bit more the party of the worker. So Jews who were fairly affluent, who did well in business, and were in the North, would typically um, would typically factor in the Republican, were, were typically sympathize with the Republican Party. Other types of Jews... Uh, like Henry Morgenthau, who later became Secretary of the Treasury under Franklin Delano Roosevelt, uh, he wanted to. He became Democrats, but they refused to work with Tammany Hall. I mentioned Tammany Hall a little earlier. We'll discuss that also a little bit more a little later. But they didn't want to work with Tammany Hall because Tammany Hall, which ran New York City politics, was very very corrupt. Most Jews, on the other hand, were relatively uninvolved with party politics. Uh, early in the 1900s. Jews generally voted Republican. You know, today that's kind of reversed itself, especially in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. Jews ver voted very strongly towards the Democratic side. Today, Jews still generally vote Democratic, although a little bit less than uh, than a while ago. But in the early 1900s, when the Republican Party was still primarily the party of the North, Jews did support the Republican Party. Also, Teddy Roosevelt, who was president in the early 1900s, um, was had it was basically he was uh he, he was pro jewish in many respects and the jews appreciated that and generally voted republican because he was a republican uh jews were not necessarily sympathetic to democrats because of tammany hall as we discussed which was the political machine that ran new york and was extremely corrupt and their idealist politics Although, as Tammany Hall did with other groups, what Tammany Hall would do very often to keep their power is they would pay off or uh, or get 
miscreants, uh, people from the streets, to try to help with their vote-getting techniques and try to help uh, vote uh, get consolidate power. In the 19, really, I guess a little bit earlier, uh, in the 19 teens, I guess, was, saw the rise of Al Smith. Al Smith was eventually governor of New York. In 1928, he actually ran for president uh, and lost. But in Al Smith originally started as a New York state legislature, but he eventually went on to become New York governor. Al Smith was a very, very popular New York politician in the early 1900s, and Jews did support him. He was a Democrat, but he also was a populist. He wanted he wanted to help the workers. He wanted to help poor people. He was really one of the more progressive politicians uh, to do well in New York. He actually, believe it or not, was a Tammany Hall a politician. He did get his start through Tammany Hall, but he really wasn't like the other Tammany Hall people. He didn't have the same level of corruption. He was more about populism. He was more about serving the people, and he went on to have a very successful career as a New York politician, and Jews generally did support Al Smith and his government. Now, the Jews did have a an interesting relationship with Tammany Hall because Tammany Hall basically ran New York politics from the mid 1800s, uh, starting with Boss Tweed in the 1860s, and really not ending until the election of Fiorello LaGuardia. Uh, I think that was 1932. Although Tammany Hall didn't officially end activities for another 30 or 40 years. After 1932, it was much less pervasive and much less powerful. Um, so Tammany Hall really wasn't interested in sharing power with any eth ethnic group, so they didn't really want to share power with the Jews, of course. But, of course, as Jews gained in population in New York, and remember, Jews were a very large population in New York going into the early and mid-1900s, uh, Tammany needed to get support, to keep uh, Jewish support, to keep uh, winning elections. And so what they did is that they dealt directly with Jewish bartenders and saloon keepers to try to infiltrate the community. Basically, they would pay them off to try to support them and get other people to vote for them. Tammany did provide services for Jewish immigrants who had dealings with the government. In exchange, they were expected to support um, they would support the election of Tammany politicians. Basically, uh, they would go to people who were having po having problems with government bureaucrats and say, "We'll help you, you know, if you help us get elected." The Tammany Hall leaders tended to be Irish. You know, Al Smith, for example, was Irish, um, although they they had people from other ethnic groups that were involved. But primarily, it was an Irish organization, and the Irish leaders were much more powerful, of course, than the Jewish politicians were within Tammany Hall, and the relationship worked out fairly well, and the reason is because they had different goals. The Irish politicians within Tammany Hall, the Irish figures within Tammany Hall, wanted to keep power, consolidate power at the top. The Jewish interest, the Jewish people who cooperated with Tammany Hall, their interest was mainly in advancing their careers and also the gener general welfare of their people. So because of that, they didn't generally fight with each other. The Jews were generally content to work under the Irish, even where Jews were the majority and had more people than the Irish. They let the Irish lead as long as the Jews would be able to, um, as long as the Irish would be able to uh, keep continue to lead the lead the organization. Okay, um, Jews did serve as important advisors under Al Smith and Franklin Delano Roosevelt. We'll discuss a little bit later on about Bell Moskowitz, and uh, maybe we'll discuss a word or two about Robert Moses, etc. But uh, but the Tammany power structure typically chose Jews for their on the basis of their willingness to play within the Tammany system. Jews who were effective and content to let the Tammany Hall powers that be run the show were favored by the Tammany Hall politicians. Okay, and finally in the area of Jewish politics is the trend that really started pretty far back in the 1910s and really kind of moved all the way until today, and that is the turn of the Jews towards the National Democrats, the Democratic Party. We saw a little bit earlier how originally with Teddy Roosevelt, Jews tended to vote Republican, but then Woodrow Wilson really moved the Jews a little bit towards the Democratic side. When Woodrow Wilson went for president, more Jews started turning towards him because, first of all, he had a background as an intellectual. I think he was a Princeton from Princeton. And also, he his rhetoric, what he said in terms of his 
campaigns was much more populist. He was in favor of the worker, he was in favor of the poor, etc. Also, <coughs> Wilson had a close advisor named Louis Brandeis, who would eventually become a Supreme Court Justice. I think he was the first Jew ever to be appointed as a Supreme Court Justice. And also he, by his high profile and of course being Jewish, helped move the Jewish community towards the Democratic side. When Wilson became elected, he wanted originally to name Brandeis to his cabinet, you know, as an important secretary, but there were other people who were around the president who did not, who maybe were a little bit more anti-Semitic and didn't want Brandeis to be there, and so therefore he didn't. However, as I discussed, four years later he named him, he named Brandeis to the U.S. Supreme Court, who became the first Jew named to the U.S. Supreme Court. Also, there was Al Smith, who I mentioned before. He was also, he also courted the Jewish vote with his popular and he also had a little bit of Jewish culture. He lived uh, in Lower Manhattan, near the east, near the Lower East Side, and he actually picked up some Yiddish and some Jewishisms uh, when he was younger. And he used kind of his folksy populism and uh, and Jewish knowledge to help uh, help him get the Jewish vote in New York. And even more so, perhaps, uh, <coughs> was the story of Bell Moskowitz. Bell Moskowitz became a very, very close confidant and advisor to um, to Al Smith. Al Smith, when originally he was a New York City politician, he became a state legislature, legislator and eventually became governor of the state of New York. And Bell Moskowitz, for many, many decades, was one of his closest advisors. She was a Jewish woman who became one of Smith's closest advisors and, one of, and therefore was one of the most powerful Jews in the state. She remained behind the scenes and helped Smith with many tasks, including organizing his campaign. She would help practice uh, his speeches with him. She advised him on legislation. And she also made herself a bridge between Smith and the Jewish community in general. And, and in addition, she was also smart enough to kind of stay in the background. She wasn't, she wasn't appointed to any official political capacity. She didn't want people to become jealous of her as being also discriminating in terms of being a Jew and being a woman, actually. Being a woman in power wasn't so easy in those days either. And she was so important to Al Smith that when Smith lost the presidential election of 1828, uh, he advised Franklin Roosevelt, who was like the next big, powerful Democratic politician in New York, to be gaining power. He um, advised Roosevelt to take her on as a secretary. But Roosevelt refused, perhaps because he didn't want somebody who had been so loyal to Smith be such an impo important advisor for him. I mean, the, the relationship between Smith and, and Roosevelt is very complex. They were both Democrats, of course, both from New York, though they did have a little bit of a rivalry, and they certainly had certain issues with each other. They had certain disagreements with each other, of course, and Roosevelt didn't want... Smith's closest advisor to be one of his conf him, his main confidants as well. Now we turn to chapter 13 in the book, uh, part of unit 3, really a brand new unit, brand new type of part of the course. And the unit is entitled The Culture of Yiddish, and the uh, chapter is entitled The Yiddish Word. We're going to be discussing various aspects of Yiddish and Jewish culture in the early part of the 20th century. Now keep in mind that, again, most of these things had very little to do with religion. Even though they were Jewish, they were still not very religious. For the most part, people who were involved, the poets over here, were not necessarily religious at all. In fact, very often they were anti-religious. Okay, so let's take a look at some general ideas regarding um, regarding Yiddish literature. Though Yiddish literature did flourish in Eastern Europe in the 1800s, there was very little that was actually produced in the United States. Uh, there were Whatever literature there was in the United States, from a Yiddish perspective, was imported from Europe. There were the works of people like uh, Shalom Aleichem and Mendel Mochus Farm were imported to the United States. One reason was is because of the Americanization attitude of the Jewish people. When the Jewish people came to America, if they wanted to produce fiction, if they wanted to produce literature, uh, they did so in English, and they did so within English culture. They didn't necessarily want to go back. Not all Jews wanted to go back and produce literature that was more emblematic of Eastern Europe. In addition, although I should say, Yiddish did serve as a gateway language 
for immigrant Jews because it, the fact that people in America still did at least speak Yiddish to some extent helped the immigrant Jews a lot. Very often when the Jews landed at Ellis Island, all they spoke was Yiddish, and eventually a generation later they would be speaking pretty much only English, but in the meantime there was Yiddish served as a gateway language. So what literature there was produced in Yiddish was produced partially because of the people, the immigrants that still spoke Yiddish used that and continued to use that while adopting uh, American culture. Now there were many there were, however, some uh, contributions of, to Yiddish culture in the United States. Poetry, there were, the book lists a whole bunch of Yiddish poets. I'm not going to go through all of them, but I'll go through a, a, a few of them. There was Jacob Sobel, who was actually a non-Orthodox rabbi, whose works were based on Enlightenment or Haskalah themes, in other words, not religious. There was Yakum Zunzer, who had a reputation as being a badchen, in in, uh, in Eastern Europe, and he had, of course, more of a folk style, more of a comedic style, more of a style that, uh, you know, like a commentary on the culture. There were also the quote-unquote sweatshop writers. I alluded to them a little bit earlier in the course as well, but the sweatshop writers wrote about the brutal work conditions and the brutal living conditions of the, um, of the sweatshop workers and of the Jewish immigrants. Morris Rosenfeld was an example who wrote plays about the immigrant worker's life, and the the people who did write in Yiddish, the people who produced the Yiddish poetry and the Yiddish literature, one reason they did so, other than entertainment, was to make money. Yiddish writers were very often, especially in the sweatshop, the sweatshop writers, they had they were sweatshop workers, which means they didn't make a lot of money and they worked very very hard. And writing and producing poetry was one way some people actually helped uh, supplement their income to make a little bit more of a decent living. De Jung was an example of a publication in the early 20th century of literature that was produced by Yiddish-speaking people. Um, the people who produced, who wrote for these, were immigrants. They were in Yiddish, of course, and most of them were actually sweatshop workers and didn't have much education. But this was, really, it was a group, it was like a compedium, almost uh, you know, a newspaper or magazine filled with poetry that was written by Jewish immigrants. They didn't have any specific ideology or political goals. It wasn't like it was a radical left-wing paper like many of the other Yiddish publications were. And what they tried to do is they were influenced by the great Eastern European Yiddish poets. Um, there were imp many important contributors. Again, some examples. I don't expect you to remember the exact names of all these people, but the, here are some examples. There was Manny Lieb, there was Leivik, H. Leivik, who actually wrote in, with deep apocalyptic pessimism, with an interest and yearning for the mystical and the messianic. I and mean, you can see over here, just that, from that one example, you can see how varied the styles of these Yiddish writers were. You know, there was not really one central theme. Like Jews in general, they had many different opinions and many different uh, philosophies in terms of the literature that they produced. Now let's move on to Yiddish post-World War II press. We've been discussing until now pre-World War II Yiddish press. Well, after World War II, you had many other uh, Yiddish poets, including Jacob Gladstein. Jacob Gladstein was a famous Yiddish uh, poet who was famous for many different things. I have over here some quotes from, uh, from Wikipedia, actually. Uh, this, for example, he was interested in exotic themes, poems that emphasized the sounds of the words. He went to Europe, and he he actually was both. Um, I'm sorry, this is after World War One. He was actually both pre World War Two and after World War Two. He was really a very famous Jewish poet from the 1920s and 30s all the way through the 50s. You had Aaron Lands Lelys, you had uh, N. N. Minkoff, you had various other um, Yiddish poets who were uh, who were you know famous in the early 19, really before World War Two and even after World War Two. But Yiddish literature underwent a change after World War II, based on the Holocaust, of course. Um, in terms of Yiddish literature in Europe itself, that became essentially non-existent because of the Holocaust. You know, after the Holocaust, most of the Jews either got killed or, you know, or escaped and left Europe altogether. And so, obviously, Yiddish literature after World War II in Europe was pretty much, uh, you know, was pretty much stopped completely.
And even that, even aside from that, even in the United States, there was a tremendous decrease or a tremendous change in style in Yiddish literature after World War II. The Holocaust as a theme was overwhelming in post-war Jewish literature, uh, like Jacob Gladstein, Isaac Bashev Singer, and a few other people stood out as post-war Yiddish poets. And Singer specifically was Orthodox. He wrote a lot about religious struggles uh, undertaken by, by the Jews. And in general, the spirit of the Holocaust uh, to, was really affected the Jewish literature so much because it caused the literature to more be, you know, trying to cope with the Holocaust. Things like Jewish fate, Jewish destiny, things like that. Uh, really, things like talking about the old, uh, you know, ghetto um, lifestyle, the, the Shtetl lifestyle, really was much less popular after World War II. The Yiddish literature in general became much more, uh, became much more serious. Another thing that's true is, generally speaking, as we're going to see a little bit later on, Yiddish language literature in general became was becoming less and less popular because of the fact that the Americans were Americanized, were getting more and more Americanized. Religious people who still had a connection to Jewishness in general didn't really focus so much on producing this kind of secular literature. And of course people in Europe, you know, when they after the Holocaust there really were no more Jews in Europe pretty much. And the next thing we're going to move on to is chapter 16. Chapter 16 is entitled The Yiddish Press. The Yiddish Press, of course, the Yiddish language press, the press newspapers that were in Yiddish language. Today it's virtually non-existent. There are a few more, much, much more recent popular, um, more recent publications, all being religious. But back in the old days, back in the early part of the 20th century, uh, there was a lot of, there were many Yiddish newspapers that were secular, that just were based on the Jewish immigrant communities. Starting out as fragile weeklies in the late 1800s, the Yiddish papers actually became very pervasive and very important part of Jewish life in the United States. You know, today there's many other ways to communicate things like we have the internet, of course, telephones. In those days, it was pretty much the newspaper was how everybody got their news and how everybody was able to communicate. Uh, in the late 1800s, the Jewish newspapers were anarchist, and other leftist Jewish newspapers became important in the Jewish radical establishment. You know, as we discussed, their Jewish socialism and Jewish anarchism was pretty common, and the way they got their word out and tried to recruit other people is by publishing these uh, these newspapers. They were really not so much businesses, these newspapers, but they were ways for people to get their views out. They were outpourings of collective sentiments. In other words, the reason for these things being put out, the reason for these newspapers being put out by these political organizations were not so much to make money, although that was probably a side issue, but it was to establish a political movement. But unfortunately, as was the case with non-Jewish newspapers around the country, the Yiddish newspapers started to become more and more weighed down by sensationalism and things that weren't true. I mean, even the other, even the big newspapers, you know, the, the, the big media magnates at the time in the late 1800s, you had newspapers who were run by uh, famous people like William Randolph Hearst and Joseph Pulitzer, I mean, people who ran enormous newspaper empires, and because of the fact that they dominated the news, you know, this was long before TV, it was even before radio, that that's how people got their news. Everybody pretty much had to buy a newspaper or they wouldn't know what was going on. And in order to outsell each other, newspaper magnates would start writing things that either weren't true or were only partially true or were sensationalist, and the Yiddish newspapers were no exception. Again, keep in mind these were not necessarily religious newspapers at all. In fact, they were generally radical political newspapers. The publishers themselves, in fact, were often irreligious, left-wing, uh, unscrupulous people who would make up any story that the people would read. John Paley was one example. He was a newspaper publisher of a Jewish newspaper called the Tajblat, T-A-G-E-B-L-A-T-T, -T, which we'll discuss also in a few minutes. But he was somebody who would 
you know, pretty much resort to sensationalism and write anything that people that he thought people were going to read. A different newspaper, a little bit more respectable newspaper that lasted, really dominated the Yiddish press throughout the early part of the 20th century, was the Jewish Daily Forward. The Jewish Daily Forward, for the most part, for decades, was run by a man by the name of Abraham Kahan. And Abraham Kahan became a very important figure in the news because he was the most respected Yiddish news source uh, in the early part of the 20th century. The Jewish Daily Forward became the largest Yiddish newspaper and was a powerful institution in the Jewish immigrant world, where the Jewish immigrants really respected and relied on the Jewish Daily Forward for their news more than pretty much anything else. Unlike other specific cause newspapers, it was, it was the Jewish Daily Forward was a liberal newspaper, it was a socialist leaning newspaper, but it was also it also tried to make sure to cover other issues and it covered a wide variety of areas it had a little sensationalism but it didn't but it did a relatively respectable job of reporting the news discussing the issues that people felt were important while also being a little bit of a uh, news was also try, being a political a little bit of political propaganda so abraham khan he ran the newspaper for many years he did put in socialist propaganda but he did it in a way that the common people can understand and appreciate. He was also happened to be a, no, a novelist and a great producer of literature. Um, but Abraham Kahn was a very important figure in Yiddish literature in the early part of the 20th century. And during this time, really in the early 1900s, the two major, newspa the two major newspapers, the, ta the Tajblat under Joseph Paley that we discussed, and the Forward under Kahan, were, real were always fighting with each other. The Tajblat being more right-wing and, uh, and the Forward being more left-wing, the Tajblat being a little bit more sensationalist, Kahan being, and the uh, Forward being a little bit more uh, newspaper-like. And they often define themselves as Paley's right-leaning politics against Kahan's left-leaning politics. Um, the forward also had some other characteristics. It discussed intermarriage and entanglements with the secular culture. It also discussed generational clashes between the European parents who were used to European culture and didn't want to lose that, and the children who were Americanized and college-educated. College and it also criticized the excesses of radical secularism. Uh, um, even though it was a left-leaning paper, and left-leaning papers were typically associated with secularism, it still criticized the excesses of secularism among non-religious Jews. And what one thing that it did, one thing that the forward did that gave it a huge advantage over other newspapers, was it started to establish a column, a regular feature in the newspaper called the Bintel Brief. And what that literally means is a bundle of letters. And it was a very important device. It was kind of, it was one of the first advice columns or that where the readers were able to write in and it was kind of like a column where readers sought advice and the editors would give them advice it sought advice many of them women um, who to write in about their problems and the letters would come from illiterate and semi-immigrant uh, semi-literate immigrants it didn't necessarily come from people who wrote well or understood uh, how to write and everything and the immigrants really appreciated it because even the regular people could write into the newspaper and their views and their letters would be published and the response of the editor with their advice would appear alongside it. So it gave the immigrant Jews a voice in the media and the immigrant Jews appreciated the opportunity to get their letters published to air their views. So not only did it become very popular and a very important staple of the Jewish media, it also gave kind of a loud the community's sense and the community's um, culture and feelings to bleed into the newspaper. That was a very important feature of the of the Jewish Daily Forward. And other newspapers tried things that were similar, but none of them ever really achieved the success that the Forward did with these features. Socialism also was not only part of the Forward, although the forward did, of course, advocate socialism. Other newspapers did it well. Socialism, in fact, became a very popular theme with other Jewish newspapers as well. Now, the thing about socialism in general, and again, I alluded to a little bit to, er, to this earlier, uh, it was also a theme, the idea of the Jewish socialists, 
people like Meyer London and Morris Hillequit, which we discussed before, when World War I came, it became a little bit of a conundrum for the newspapers. Because on the one hand, the, there were the pulls of supporting the war due to patriotism, but also opposing it based on socialist principles. And once the Russian Revolution happened in 1917, the support for the Russian Revolution among the socialists, support for the communists, was also viewed with a little suspicion and a little worrisome by the rest of the American people. Plus, the Red Scare of, the, of 1919 and 1920 which caused very great discomfort for communists and socialists in the United States, and the American antipathy to the Bolshevik government. The Bolsheviks are the, are the communists that took over, uh, took over Russia in 1917. And I'm sorry if I didn't mention that before, in case you're unfamiliar with it. Um, in 19, during World War I, World War I lasted from 1914 until 1918, really. And in 1917, while Germany was fighting against Russia, the communists, or the Bolsheviks, led an October Revolution in October of 1917 and overthrew the Tsars and took over control of Russia and eventually negotiated a peace treaty with Germany and dropped out of the war. Of course, socialists and communists typically supported that, but other countries looked at that with a little bit of suspicion. And this really caused socialist newspapers like the Forward to kind of, they had to be very careful not to offend American sensibilities, but on the other hand, they did want to support socialism and communism, which made things a little complex. There were other Jewish newspapers that were established at the time. The Forward and the Taj Blot were two, the two major ones, but you also had the Yiddisher Americaner, which was actually published by William Randolph Hearst, who was one of the most famous um, newspaper magnates of the day. They, they later made a movie about his life uh, called Citizen Kane, which... Uh, which was rated by some people as the greatest movie of all time. And personally, I thought I really wasn't too impressed by it, but uh, that's a different issue. Yiddish Welt, which was set up by Louis Marshall, another famous Jewish cultural figure, with the help of many rich Jewish German-Jewish financiers. It was also it was written more to be clean and wholesome and religious rather than being sensationalist and left-wing. And there were many other small newspapers for a variety of political and religious viewpoints, but usually they did not do well. One notable example of a newspaper was The Day. The Day was another Yiddish newspaper that focused on appealing to people that were a little bit more high class, more literate. Uh, people who cared for tradition. Um, people who, they also published pages that were highly intellectual on issues of philosophical and culture. And to attract readers, they did go into sensationalism a little bit, but by and large, it was a little bit more highbrow, it was a little bit more literate than some of the other newspapers. It also published a very a serial so, a soap opera, you know, basically a series of books, serial book, uh, by Sarah Bronstein Smith, who was a sweatshop worker who became very her her work became very famous. She wrote works of fiction that were based on courtroom scenes and and interesting dialogue and interesting discussion. And so Sarah Bronstein Smith, through writing a serialized book in the day, eventually became very famous. And again, the day was never as popular as the Jewish Forward, but it did have some success in the day, at least partially because of that. Now we start the last unit, Unit 4, entitled Dispersion, with the chapter, Chapter 17, entitled Journeys Outward, from the original origin of the Jewish community on the Lower East Side in Manhattan and other New York communities. We're now going to discuss the growth of the American Jewish community through the 20th century. Most Jewish parents, of course, as you can probably... Is applies very often today as well, wanted their children to be professionals, white-collar professionals, accountants, doctors, manufacturers, and other professionals. However, many is children of immigrants went into entertainment and show business. Uh, Jew the Jewish community had traditionally had people who had also served as entertainers, maybe in a less formal capacity. People like the Badchen, the Fiddler, uh, gave impetus for this idea of being entertainers. 
In addition, there was a lot of source material. The issue, the the shtetl life, and there was a lot. I guess there was a lot of material to make fun of, and this, I guess, contributed to the culture of the Jewish community wanting to be entertainers. And even in the early 1900s, Jews controlled large portions portions of the theatrical business of the business of entertainment in New York. The streets became a tr a training ground for budding Jewish actors and comedians. Uh, there were many examples of people who got their starts in these small-time street-level comedic operations, including such famous people as Groucho Marx. And young, aspiring Jewish entertainers tried very tried pretty much anything. They were willing to go play for cheap and on the streets or in these um, low-rent comedy houses to, you know, to start to get their starts. And of course, many famous Jewish comedians did that. There wasn't very much in terms of religion involved there. In fact, the community of Judaism and the religion was really not considered sacred, was not considered off limits, and pretty much anything could be made fun of or lambasted when it came to entertainment and com comedy. There were, I mean, it, things that, that would never be tolerated today. I mean, there were people <coughs> who did uh, performing in blackface. There's actually a picture in the book of somebody performing in blackface, basically making fun of African Americans by singing uh, with their face painted black. I mean, the sort of thing that you'd pretty much never see today was nevertheless happened in those days. There were burlesque shows, even making fun of Jewish names and Jews in general, like in a play called My Yiddish Mama, where it happened and, and were fairly common. But, of course, these were not really meant to criticize. They weren't really meant to offend. They were really kind of almost teasing, which is the way these things were designed to be looked at and the way that they were meant. And, of course, there were many Jewish entertainers who were built through this process. Uh, Sophie Tucker was one example of the nostalgic Jews, whose humor consi consisted mainly of satire of Jewish life. And many Jewish communities used Jewish material, Jewish culture, oh. as a component of their acts. One notable exception is the famous Jewish comedian Jack Benny. Uh, you can still see a lot of his stuff on the internet. You can still see a lot of clips of him. Very, very famous comedian. And he actually was an exception in that he didn't really use Jewish culture. His humor was really more just general, secular, American-style humor. Now, in the middle part of the century, really after the Holocaust, Jewish comedians did start to decrease the Jewish or Yiddish components of their acts. And a lot of that had to do with the fact that after the Holocaust, it's almost like Jewish culture was more, I guess, tragic and less funny. The idea that after the Holocaust, to make fun of the shtetl life and to make fun of uh, Judaism and to make fun of Jewish stereotypes wasn't really considered so funny anymore. And so people, the comedians, focused more on general secular American humor rather than specifically Jewish humor. And the chapter continues with a discussion of other Jewish artists. Sculptors and painters are one example. There was a group called the Educational Alliance, a Jewish group actually, that offered art classes, even as far back as the 1880s. And this caused many, one of this, there was also a culture not only of business and entertainment and comedy, there was also a culture of producing art in various other ways. And this produced many famous Jewish artists. Some of these included Maurice Stern, who was a sculptor and painter of, arch, archa, of archaic Greek statutes, old Greek statutes. Joe Davidson, who specialized in realistic, intense portrait busts. Um, William Zorak whose works, works can be found in many private, corporate, and public collections. And these were all Jewish artists, sculptors, and painters that, who lived in the late 1800s or early 1900s. Jewish culture also spawned very important Jewish novelists, authors, who would write about various Jewish themes. And Jewish writing was an absorbing of the local immigrant experience into a natural culture. It was really the idea, the Jewish novelists, people who wrote Jewish literature, kind of reflected the experience of the Americanization of the Jewish, uh, of the Jewish immigrants. It was defined not as being a fixed society, but a changing society changed by alien intruders. I mean, intruder is a little bit of a harsh word here. What I mean is that uh, it, the, the novels, the literature, 
really reflected the change in the community from an original all Yiddish Eastern European immigrant community to an Americanized community. General themes of the Jewish writing included many different things. Of course, dealing with anti-Semitism and hatred, always part of the Jewish experience. Russian and Eastern European Romanticism, which again also reflected the fact that this was an Eastern European Jewish community. The immigrant culture, and of course the the impact of traditional stereotypical Jewish neighborhood influences. The Shadchan and various other, uh, the, in other words, the literature dealt with these people who had influence over over the Jewish communities. Then you had another part of the culture, another part of the Jewish literature and the Jewish Jewish culture was the quote unquote New York intellectuals. And this was because, as we discussed earlier in the course, in the early 1900s, City College had a very high Jewish influence. It became a training ground for bright and ambitious Jewish boys because there were many Jewish immigrants and their parents pushed them to go to college and many of them went to City College of New York. It was open admission, it was relatively cheap, and many of the Jewish people actually went there. The first generation of Jewish intellectuals was Yiddish speaking. The Americanization and the college education of the second generation were all generally English speaking not necessarily Yiddish. And the New York intellectuals were really the first group of Jewish writers to come out who did not identify themselves through their Judaism and Jewish culture. And again, this is something, another, th another important theme, that the Yiddish culture, dating back into late 1800s, early 1900s, kind of slowed down and almost died over time. Because the people, again, the religious people didn't really produce that much of this secular culture anyway. The people who were non-religious, even though in the first generation they may have identified themselves as Eastern European immigrants, once they got to the second generation and third generation, these children who grew up and went to city college and became part of the intellectual base, they looked at themselves more and more as Americanized and they started doing things rel relevant to American culture, not necessarily to Jewish culture. And now we move into the very last chapter, Modern Trends of America's Jews. By the 1950s, after World War II, of course, now the most of the people who had come over a couple of generations ago and worked in the sweatshops had moved up to middle and upper class occupations. Of course, this was a tremendous success in economic terms of the Jewish community. Working class Jews are still, or and of course are, still found in New York City. The segment of working class Jews is shrinking in size and relative weight. Jews also branched out into many ty different types of occupations. Things like farming, uh, government work, clerical work, things that generally weren't associated with the Jewish immigrants who were typically either workers in factories or, um, you know, doctors, uh, manufacturers, managers, things like that. In fact, in 1957, over 55% of Jews employed in the United States were professionals or managers or proprietors. In other words, the actual people working in the factory had decreased substantially. And of course, these trends continued into the latter part of the 20th century and, in fact, of course, continue to this very day. The thing about Jewish demographics is an interesting and kind of a sad, <laughs> sad commentary, actually, and that is that there's been a tremendous attrition of people who considered themselves Jews. Remember, a lot of Jews came over in the, from Eastern Europe in the 1880s, and many of them became non-religious, and many, many of them became lost to assimilation. I mean, the idea, the number of Jews, the raw number of Jews in the U.S. has stayed pretty steady in the last 60 or 70 years. Basically, there were about five and a half million Jews in the United States in 1950 or so, and there are really about that same number, five, five and a half million Jews today. And so normally you would expect tremendous population growth, and there has been population growth in the U.S. as a whole, and yet the Jewish, the rate of Jews has stayed steady. And the percentage of Jews in the United States has gone down from about 5% to, to about 2%. And the reason is, is because first of all, especially among the secular culture, among the non-religious Jews, a relatively low birth rate, assimilation, and people who were the children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren of the immigrants went away from, who, who were not religious, went away from Yiddish and Jewish culture, since it really didn't have much to offer them uh, at, at that point. 
Um, and therefore, this has caused a, the, a, the percentage of Jews in the U.S. to decrease for the last 50 years. Of course, the exception are the Orthodox and ultra-Orthodox who tend to stay Jewish and tend to have many children. Jews do tend to be much better educated than the general population, especially the non-religious. Um, in fact, college attendance rates are estimated at more than 80%, which is much higher than the rates of the general population. And the major... Jewish centers in the early, I mean, so far in the course, we really haven't discussed much outside of New York, because in the early 1900s, late 1800s, outside of New York, there really wasn't very much of a Jewish community. There were different communities in New York, Williamsburg and the Lower East Side and Harlem, Upper East Side, uh, Brownsville, uh, etc., but outside of New York, there really wasn't very much. But a slow and steady trend in the 20th century was for Jews to move from the East to the West into various Western communities, places like Chicago, Los Angeles, uh, areas like that, and from city to suburb. Most of the Jews started out in the cities, and today, on the other hand, many Jews have moved out to the suburbs, and there are enormous Jewish communities in suburban areas, such as, for example, uh, you know, Muncie or Lakewood. We all, you know, we all know what these things are. Okay, now Jewish power in the is a little. Jews have actually been a little bit underrepresented in areas of of genuine power in the corporate economy. A study showed that Harvard Business School graduates who were non-Jewish outnumbered Jewish graduates in the corporate executive position proportionally by 30 to 1 ratio. Somebody that graduated Harvard Business School was 30 times more likely to become a major corporate executive if that person was non-Jewish. And perhaps some disguised or even half-disguised policies of social exclusion, of exclusion of Jews uh, from secular, from non-Jewish institutions, um, may have caused that in some cases. And that's a continuation of the suburbs, really, what we discussed before. Uh, as Jews became more affluent, they moved from the city to the suburbs, from the Lower East Side to Riverdale, from, uh, you know, from, from Williamsburg to, uh, you know, to the Five Towns, or whatever it is. People moved more towards the suburbs. And as they did, the structure of Jewish life, as you can imagine, took a major change. Things that spoke to the traditional ways were left behind in non-religious communities. In religious communities, in Muncie and Lakewood, of course, you still have religious Jewish culture, but Yiddish culture, the culture of the streets, the culture of the immigrants, kind of faded away once they, le once they left to the suburbs. If you're non-religious, but you read Yiddish newspapers and look, watched Yiddish theater uh, in the Lower East Side, you may have had kept some identity with Judaism and religious culture even if you weren't religious. But if you move out to Lawrence or you move out to Westchester and you're not religious, the idea you're probably just going to be subject to American culture and follow American culture and you're probably not going to have much use for Yiddish culture. So Yiddish groups and Yiddish culture have tended to fade. Attendance at services and synagogues for non-Orthodox decreased to the point where only the high holidays brought out large crowds. Of course, that's generally true today. You look at reform synagogues, you look at uh, conservative synagogues. Um, very often you have attendance on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, but you don't really have very much attendance in other parts of the year, certainly not on a day-to-day -day or week-to-week -week basis. And religious observances for the non-Orthodox tended to become more symbolic and less meaningful. For the people who were non-religious, for the people who were non-Orthodox, the observances became and are becoming less and less. And the non-Orthodox Jews became more focused on achieving a good life than preserving their Jewish culture, sometimes referred to as the Bagel and Lox Judaism as the book refers it. The idea of that you're Jewish because you have some stereotypical background. Maybe you have bagel and lox and, and that makes you Jewish, but there wasn't really a whole lot uh, in the culture, in the in, certainly in religion, that's relevant to the non-religious suburbs. Certainly the Yiddish culture that we've discussed so much in this course has kind of been absent from the more affluent uh, Jewish suburbs. That's led to the caricature, which I just mentioned, of the, the, the suburban Jews and their bagel and lox Jewish, Jewishness, as we just discussed. Wealthy suburbanite Jews often took traditional ceremonies and re recreational opportunities that were traditionally Jewish, things like le weddings and bar mitzvahs and you know Jewish hotels and vacation spots, and instead of them being 
having to do with Jewish culture or religion, they've become parties and recreational opportunities. You know, a wealthy suburbanite non-religious Jew may still have a bar mitzvah, may still have a Jewish wedding, so to speak, but it doesn't really have much Jewishness left. It's really more about culture, really more about having a party. So these ceremonies and other elements of non-Orthodox suburban culture, culture were often painted as bland, insincere, and meaningless. Okay, now let's move to public realm. In other words, Jewish thought in terms of um, what the, 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 the impact of Judaism and on politics. Well, American Jews are usually committed to politics of liberalism in terms of guaranteeing people basic rights and liberties. Remember, Jews moved over to the Democratic Party, the more liberal party, way, ba way back in, under Woodrow Wilson in the 1910s, and that has pretty much continued throughout the century. Jews supported the New Deal under Franklin Delano Roosevelt. The New Deal, Deal was a series of social spending reforms trying to improve the um, improve the lot of poor people, uh, starting from things like Social Security and uh, minimum wages, working conditions, things like that. Jews also generally supported the civil rights campaigns on behalf of Southern African Americans. During the civil rights marches and civil rights protests in the South on behalf of African Americans, Jews were very often very much a part of that protest. Of all the white groups, Jews probably le um, lent the most support of any of those groups to the African American freedom and equality cause. This did lead, well, this you know, also, there was also a movement of Jewish socialism, as we discussed. This is true even among Jewish capitalists, even among Jewish people who were in favor of economic freedom and economic capitalism. They still primarily were also in favor of, of civil rights and social justice. So therefore, Jews have typically supported Democrats over Republicans. This trend has decreased a little bit into the 21st century, into these days. And there are some reasons. First of all, of course, because of cultural issues. Now, Jews tend to be a little bit more conservative from a social policy perspective. Um, and, and, and also, of course, issues like Israel, things like that, have caused the Jews to move a little bit more towards the Republican side. But still, Jews tend to be a strongly Democratic constituency. And finally, for this course, we're going to look at some of the difficulties faced by American Jews and the goals of American Jews. One is the issue of Israel. Israel certainly presents a very complex challenge for American Jews. The First of all, the emergence of the state of Israel has the effect of speeding the dissolution of the ideologies that prevailed among the immigrant Jews. Jews before that were either, you know, were pro-Zionist, and some Jews were pro-Zionist, some Jews were anti-Zionists, but typically, again, there were, with some exceptions, of course, most Jews, once Israel was founded, put aside their differences to support the Jewish state. So Jews generally now support Israel by and large, whether they were previously Zionist, or socialist, or both, or neither. In fact, Israel caused the Jews no longer to be thought of as wanderers or rootless. In that sense, Israel has really increased the morale of even non-religious Jews who now can identify with a country, can now can identify with a group, rather than being considered rootless and being not considered with a particular culture. Israel has also become an alternative to assimilation. And people who are non-religious very often would have gone off and become you know, regular Americans and totally assimilated and, and had nothing to do with religion or Israel or Jews. But because of Israel, very often they'll either go to Israel or uh, at least have some cultural ties to Israel. And another challenge for American Jews regarding Israel is the du dual loyalties. The idea, you know, are you an American or are you a Jew? In other words, do you support Israel more if there was a conflict with the U.S., or do you support the United States because you're an American? This is, of course, a constant source of challenge. But paradoxically, the book points out, very interestingly, it's also allowed American Jews to avoid facing the question of whether Jewishness required religion. Whereas at one point, somebody who was Jewish but looking not to be so religious might have had to think, well, you know, if I'm not religious, then what do I, what's my Judaism worth? Now they can just say my Judaism is supporting the state of Israel. Instead, they just focus on Israel as the central component of their Judaism, and they don't have to worry about maintaining religion. In other words, if, they, if there was a question of a secular Jew whether to teach his or her children about Judaism and religion, whereas 
old times, they might have done so in order to avoid the, the child losing the Jewish identity. Now it's not as urgent because Israel takes over that identity. Unfortunately, there's also been anti-Semitism to some extent in the United States, not nearly as much as in Europe, of course, but there is social anti-Semitism. Um, the anti-Semitism in the U.S. has generally been relatively harmless. You've never had, obviously, the same kind of pogroms and terrible measures that you had in Europe. There have been public anti-Semites in the United States in the early part of the 1900s. Father Coughlin, who gave radio addresses you know, as a Christian, uh, where that was very much against, against the Jews. Henry Ford, of course, the head of Ford Motor Company, founder of Ford Motor Company, who was notoriously anti-Semitic. And... But that has gotten less and less as we've moved along, and even those people were never, their anti-Semitism never really caught on. Uh, for most of the 20th century, ironically, the status, you know, African Americans were considered the, uh, the despised minority, the minority group that, that was the lightning rod, so to speak, and that might have actually created a little bit of a buffer to the Jews, uh, because of the fact that it really wasn't the Jews that were being despised, it was the African Americans that were being despised as the minority instead. However, also, unfortunately, at, at times, Jews have suffered anti-Semitism at the hands of African American leaders who blame the Jews for their economic woes. You know, people like uh, uh, Jesse Jackson and Louis Farrakhan and, and people like that. Well, that, it's hard to put them in the same category. I mean, Farrakhan was a notorious and open anti-Semite, whereas Jackson is a little bit more benign. But either way, there, there have been African American oh. leaders who have used anti-Semitism as a way to rally their own people. And that's caused a little bit of hardship in those relations. And now we're already in the epilogue, we're in the, uh, after, at the end of the book, and that discusses the idea of Jewish end goals. What is the final goal for the Jewish communities in the United States? Well, for Orthodox, it's been the coming of Mashiach, you know, living as religious as possible until Mashiach comes. And for the Orthodox in general, no matter how good life in the United States is, it will always be part of the Gullus. Uh, that's, I think, pretty clear. I think anybody listening to this will probably understand very quickly uh, what that means. For socialists, Zionists, and the, remember the old Yiddishists, the ones that believed not necessarily in religion, but in Yiddish culture, the end goal is merely a normal life, just to have a normal life like everybody else, free of discrimination and hardship, to avoid living in, as wanderers and pariahs, people who are hated by the general population. Um, the most Jewish thinkers, even the secular ones, have concluded that as Jews they couldn't really gain a normal life with the other segments of society without assimilating. And that's why, unfortunately, many Jew Jewish people, uh, especially the non-religious, have assimilated into American culture. And as we discussed before, that's one reason for the dramatic decrease in people that identify themselves as Jews. And the author, the author also discussed the quote-unquote price of America, of coming to America. The U.S. from the 1880s to the present day, when the Jews have moved to the United States, has generally provided social and economic status on terms more favorable than any other country in history. Jews have generally had equal rights when it comes to economics. However, <clears throat> the price has been in the United States that many Jews have repudiated their past religion and culture, and the, decrease, the dramatic decrease in percentage-wise of people who identify themselves as Jews. And for Eastern European Jews and many Orthodox Jews, quote-unquote Americanization can almost be considered a trap or a lure. Many Jewish immigrants of several generations have seen losing their Jewish culture as a blessing. There are some people who think that that's okay. There are some people who are non-religious who have come over. You know, their grandparents or great-grandparents might have been immigrants, and they're perfectly happy to become Americans, and they're perfectly happy to shed the image of the Jewish victim as, as a negative. And the difficult times that the early immigrants faced accelerated losing these elements. The people originally who had to work in the sweatshop and couldn't get jobs because they couldn't uh, they couldn't work on Shabbos, and who had to go to the, you know the children had to go to the Talmud Torah for three hours a night because they went to the public school for the whole day. Uh, very often these people were having a hard time becoming Jewish, and if they weren't religious or they lost their religion, that would speed up the hardships that they had to endure for being Jewish would speed up their descent into general American society. And finally, the culture of the Gullus Jew. You know, the Gullus Jew is, you know, it's, it's interesting. We think of that, of course, as being a strictly religious viewpoint, that the Jew is in Gullus until Mashiach comes. 
Um, but even many secular Jews in the Jewish world, especially 100 years ago, 120 years ago, thought of the Jews as being in Gullus. It was in Yiddish culture. Um, okay, so that even in the Yiddish culture, there was the idea of the wandering Jew, so to speak. But also, as we discussed before, secular culture has been abandoned by the non-religious as a method of Americanizing and easing their integration, by the religious as a recognition that secular culture was the first steps toward assimilation. So the whole idea of Yiddishism, you know, we can hardly even imagine plays and, and books being written in Yiddish, maybe newspapers for certain elements of the Hasidic community, but uh, when it comes to things like when it comes to writers like Mendel Melchor Svarim and and uh, and Peretz and and Shalom Aleichem, the these figures are are almost incomprehensible to us because these figures don't exist anymore. Uh, the non the religious Jews wouldn't really get involved in this kind of secularization of their culture because of the worry that this leads to assimilation, and the non-religious because again they just went off and become became Americanized. And that's pretty much what we have for this course. Um, I hope that you have enjoyed the um, enjoyed this little crash course over here. Uh, the exam. I don't know if uh, if you had a chance to look at the the study guide for the exam. Um, the exam has 20 multiple choice questions, 12 open-ended questions where we're going to want like a couple of sentences, maybe three sentences or so of an answer, you know, to a basic question, and then you'll have a couple of essay questions which will be a little bit longer. I think the multiple choices are worth two points each, the um, essays, the short answers are worth three points each, and the essays nine points each. You know, for for a regular question, for an open-ended question, you know, you might get a question like, uh, you know, how would the Gullus Jew um, concept have be explained by religious culture? Or, you know, you might get essay questions, you know, why did, just on this slide over here, why did... Sec Yiddish secular culture uh, become abandoned, and you know if you get that kind of a question, you could explain that uh, the religious people because that was assimilation, and the secular people uh, because they became more Americanized. And you can explain it based on the concepts that we discussed. So uh, good luck on the exam and in everything else, and um, and have a good day, everybody. Thank you for listening.